I never believed in the stories whispered around the campfires, tales of elusive creatures stalking the deep woods. As a park ranger responsible for maintaining a popular hiking trail, I prided myself on my rationality and skepticism. However, the reports began to flood and hikers claiming to have encountered a towering, Bigfoot-like figure along the path I knew so well. I laughed it off at first, dismissing the accounts as overactive imaginations fueled by the eerie silence of the dense forest. But as the tales persisted, so did the unease that crept into the hearts of those who ventured into the woods. Curiosity and a growing sense of duty led me to investigate. One foggy evening, as the sun dipped below the horizon and shadows stretched like fingers across the trail, I decided to hike the path myself. Armed with a flashlight and my skepticism, I treaded carefully along the well-worn trail, casting wary glances into the trees. The air seemed to thicken with an unspoken presence, and every rustle of leaves made my heart skip a beat. I shook off the eerie feeling, convincing myself it was merely the product of an overactive imagination. That's when I heard it a low, guttural growl that resonated through the trees. My flashlight trembled in my grasp as I turned to face the source of the sound. There, in the shadows, emerged a massive figure. It stood at least eight feet tall, covered in coarse, matted fur that seemed to absorb the moonlight. Its eyes gleamed with an otherworldly intelligence, and a foul odor hung in the air. The Bigfoot-like creature moved with an unsettling grace, its movements silent yet purposeful. Panic seized me, and instinct took over. I fumbled for the tranquilizer gun slung across my chest, convinced that capturing this creature would put an end to the unsettling reports. With a shaky hand, I aimed at the creature, my fingers trembling on the trigger. But before I could squeeze it, the creature vanished into the shadows, leaving only the echoes of its growls behind. I stood frozen, my breath shallow, grappling with the reality of what I had just witnessed. As I stumbled back along the trail, the forest seemed to close in around me, its once familiar embrace now tainted by the unknown. The reports of encounters weren't mere campfire tales. They were chilling truths etched into the heart of the woods. The legend of the Bigfoot-like figure that haunted the trail became more than just folklore. It was a living nightmare, and I, the skeptical park ranger, was now a reluctant believer, forever haunted by the memory of a creature that defied explanation, slipping away into the darkness, leaving me to grapple with the terrifying unknown that lurked within the depths of the forest. The story takes place in Western Massachusetts. Five years ago, I was driving to work bright and early in the morning, and the SUV next to me was in a right turn only lane. I was in the straight lane while we were waiting for the light to change. I didn't think much of it or look at the SUV or driver until the light changed, and they also tried going straight. At that point, I looked over as they were basically trying to run me off the road to go straight and veering into me. I was going to honk, but then the middle-aged lady who was driving, jerked head to the side, looked right at me and her whole face morphed into a terrifying face. I don't even know how to describe it. It elongated and looked awful and terrifying, like that scream painting by Edward Munch. But way more terrifying. It's like she decided to show me what she really is, and it changed in a flash. I slammed on my brakes, she, or it cut in front of me and I ended up taking the very next right turn just to get away from her and parked on the side of the road to catch my breath. I don't do drugs, I sometimes have a couple of beers after work, but nothing crazy. I've never seen anything like this before or after and I've been too scared to mention it to anyone but my husband for the fear of being called a crazy person. I saw her face change right before my eyes and to this day absolutely certain of what I saw. The feeling that came over me was just absolute terror, and the look she gave me was certainly menacing. Has anyone else ever experienced anything like that? Instead of a grin, it was an open mouth expression with a threatening, pissed-off look. But the mouth and entire eye area were black, 
and the same, an elongated pointy face that no human could just naturally morph their face to make. Really, really freaky. The color of the face changed. More like a loss of color. Everything around the eyes got really dark and had a big open dark scary mouth. I shake just thinking about that day. I've had way too many experiences that were odd. I just didn't want to include them with the story and sound like a total loon. I had a very, very traumatic childhood. I survived a war, had really terrible things happen to me, and saw horrible things happen to others including seeing children get killed. I was 10 when I came to the US as a refugee and spoke no English. I think that trauma made me more sensitive to the spirit world. I get feelings good and bad that something is going to happen, and it does. My husband and my boss call me psychic. People are also always shocked by how well I can just read their minds. I don't try to, I just know what they're trying to say before they even finish saying it. I've also experienced ghosts many times, including one in our last house that my kids and husband are 100% sure of too. He didn't give menacing feelings though and never physically manifested himself. We and even our friends experienced watching the doorknob turn on the front and back door and the doors swing open. He also has a weird thing for oil. Twice, a bottle of oil slowly moved from the back of the counter towards the front until it fell over onto the ground. Both times I had a witness with me who also saw it. I call it him because I work as a real estate paralegal and reviewed the history of the house and found a man named Dana died there young of lung cancer. However, my son, when he was young, swears that a little girl said hello to him in the bathroom there. Things slowed down there and in my new house, there is no activity at all now. When I went to visit my home country, I also went to Turkey and bought these amulets called Nazar. Once I put them in the house, the ghost activity became pretty much non-existent. I'm afraid to experiment with this spiritual sensitivity. I don't want to be bothered by spirits all the time. I went to Salem and refused to do any seances or anything that could attach a spirit to me. Years ago, I dated a guy who had a heavy drug and alcohol addiction. It was really sad. He would be the sweetest person ever during the day and then get absolutely hammered and turn into a totally different person. Mean, angry, verbally abusive. The next day, he didn't remember any of it. One night, I was drunk with him and we were having a great time. We went to bed and it was like a switch was flipped and he was angry and upset and calling me names. He started saying really weird crap like that the Chinese Mafia was after him, he was terrified and deadly serious. I'll never forget how at one point I looked at him, and he didn't look like him anymore. It was like his face changed to this creepy gesture looking face, but not human. I was like WTF, why is your face different? He responded, Eric isn't here right now. This reminds me of a line you would hear in an exorcist movie. We went to bed and of course the next day he was back to normal and had no idea what he did and said all night because he was blacked out. To this day I think he was possessed and it took over when he was drinking. He also said that one time he was a kid and he went into the woods and tried inviting a demon to possess him and nothing happened. Makes me wonder. I had an experience in an old house I was renting. I basically got a good deal. If I rented it, I would promise to work on it and fix some of the problems. This was a city auctioned hole that had been abandoned for several years and become a local dope house for the homeless. When I looked at it originally, it was infested with fleas. I was wearing a pair of shorts. Upon entering the backyard, a city public works letter of condemning notice for flea infestation. The landlord was caught off guard as he bought it sight unseen. The city came and fumigated the yard four times wearing suits with oxygen to get rid of the issue. Back to the real story of too many out of that house in just one year. 
Now a bit on me beforehand, I've been told by a few friends of the secondary nature that I hold a certain light or direction for the spiritual realm, sort of a beacon either for drawing them near or to warm them. I had to come to grips with that idea in this house, as I write my entire body tingling as every hair on me is standing straight up. Anyway, back to the story. I had a couple of friends and roommates over. It was a late night for the fun the night before. Mind you, I had just months prior to this particular incident lost my wife of seven years to lupus. Her pain was real. That is a whole different story for another day. I had been lounging all day, in and out of the kitchen. It was now about 6 p.m. in the evening late summer, I'd say August, I believe, ill. I was lying on the floor watching TV and suddenly I felt a weight in chest and my arms which were already on my chest, not really crossed but close. The weight pressed on harder for what felt like an eternity. Some say it was anxiety, but mine is different, I feel like I swallowed a softball and it is stuck. This was hard dead weight literally sucking the air right out of me then suddenly i sit straight something yanked me up in trying to call to my roommate like a night terror she finally sees me immediately comes to me and my arms won't release she even tries to slap me to no avail then i'm flip flopped over in the prone position and like you said in the movie the ring this dark hair extremely wire thin and mangled face Ripping apart at every fold, crawling under me, pulling itself straight to my face and leans in so fiercely. She lets out this terrifying blood boiling scream and odor like a sewer coming from all over her. Finally, another roommate just getting home heard the scream from outside while getting out of her boyfriend's truck and came running in to help. I hadn't spoken this story to anyone for fear of it returning. To this day, we'll never forget that face. Afterward, I immediately called my friend who was gifted, who was one of the people who told me of my gift. I went to explain it as she already knew, and let me know that someone at some time or another had ritualistic Ouija behavior or celebrations. Those so-called toys are not to be used by anyone who isn't experienced. They can bring things unwanted. One night while driving to work on Interstate 75 near Ocala, Florida about two years ago, I watched a bright light come down from the sky, almost like a helicopter, and shined a light right into the cab of my truck. I was very scared. At the same time, a car came speeding past me erratically. It was late so I couldn't see the car. Instantly, I called a friend to tell her what happened as I was really scared. She told me to pull over and so I did, into a gas station. It was about 10 p.m. I parked and tried to regain myself. Then I saw this man pull up right in front of me. He looked like he stepped right out of the 1950s, black everything. Black car wheels, windows, etc. Everything he had on was black. He also wore black sunglasses. I saw him and felt really odd. His presence took my breath away as he looked right at me. I felt very intimidated, and it was almost like no one else saw him. He went into the store and I never got out of my truck. I was too scared. On his way back to his vintage all-black car, he never stopped glaring at me. I could feel it through his glasses. He got in his car and I waited for him to leave, as I didn't want to chance him following me. He disappeared behind the gas station and never came out from the other side. I waited about 30 minutes, nothing, so I left. When I finally got to work, I sat in my truck terrified. It wasn't over. What I'm going to say next is very odd, but I'm telling you all what I saw. It was about 11.30 p.m. by then, and I noticed clouds about 200 feet away floating over and landing on the tops of trees parked right in front of me a literal stone's throw in front of me. I sat and watched, confused, to say the least. I didn't notice anyone coming or going while I watched. By the time I got out of my truck over five hours had passed. I had missed work, but was in the parking lot. I'll never know, but my face and shirt were soaking wet as if I was in tears the entire time. I felt a lot of things that night, but sadness was not one. 
I haven't really told anyone this and feared it happen again, or I would be ridiculed. In the picturesque countryside west of Eugene, nestled near the quaint town of Veneta, my wife and I experienced an extraordinary encounter on a warm summer day in 1985. Riding our trusty Vespa scooter, we reveled in the wind whistling past us as we coasted downhill, our laughter carried away by the breeze. As we descended, the vibrant green of the Oregon landscape enveloped us in a sense of serenity. The sun filtered through the leaves, casting dappled shadows on the road ahead. Our carefree spirits matched the carefree speed of our scooter. With the wind tousling our hair, it felt as if we were in our own little world, blissfully unaware of what lay just beyond the curve. With each twist and turn, we ventured closer to an unexpected spectacle that awaited us. As we rounded a bend, our eyes widened in disbelief. There, in a shallow ditch, lay a creature that defied all explanation, a massive Bigfoot, sound asleep. The creature's sandy brown fur was tinged with hints of reddish hues, its immense form cocooned in repose. The scooter's purr transformed into a soft hum as we glided closer, our fascination and trepidation mingling in our gazes. The creature, normally so elusive and rumored, lay there in all its glory, its chest rising and falling with each breath. Its features were remarkably detailed, from the dark pools of its closed eyes to the impressive muscles that defined its arms and legs. And then, as if sensing our presence, or perhaps the vibration of our approach, the Bigfoot stirred. Slowly, its eyes opened, and we found ourselves locked in a gaze that transcended the boundaries of our worldviews. The creature's gaze held a mixture of curiosity, surprise, and perhaps a touch of amusement. It was a moment suspended in time, the boundary between reality and fantasy blurring into an indistinguishable realm. As our Vespa coasted past the dozing giant, my wife and I continued to look back, our expressions a fusion of awe and disbelief. The creature watched us, its gaze lingering on our retreating figures, as if acknowledging our shared connection in that fleeting instant. The rest of the ride back to our home was a whirlwind of emotions and hushed conversations. We grappled with the enormity of what we had just witnessed, struggling to reconcile our encounter with the conventional reality we knew. Who would believe our story? Could we even believe it ourselves? In the years that followed, my wife and I found ourselves revisiting that day in our minds over and over again. We became avid researchers, delving into the mysteries of Bigfoot sightings and accounts. The memory of that summer day fueled our curiosity and guided us on a path of exploration we never could have predicted. We shared our tale with a select few, who listened with varying degrees of skepticism. Some dismissed it as a fanciful fabrication born from the excitement of a downhill ride while others entertained the possibility that we had indeed crossed paths with a creature that defied explanation. Now older but still filled with the same sense of wonder, my wife and I continued to revisit the spot where we had encountered the slumbering giant. We never saw the creature again, but the memory of its gaze remains imprinted on our souls, a reminder that the world is far more mysterious and magical than we had ever imagined. Our Vesper rides have taken on a new significance, each journey a testament to the inexplicable moments that can alter the course of one's life. And as we ride together through the hills west of Eugene, near Veneta, we know that even in the most ordinary of landscapes, extraordinary wonders can be found, if only one dares to believe in the possibility. My grandmother lives by herself in a little double wide. Out back, there is a big backyard, a huge field that a neighbor farms, and woods beyond that. I have always gotten the sensation something was out in those fields, older than the land, almost a part of the land. Last night, she fell dislocated her shoulder. My parents took her to the ER, and I volunteered to keep watch overnight with her. As soon as I stepped foot in that house, I felt a pressure and an unclean feeling come over me. 
all through the night. My skin was crawling and I just felt unclean and like something was in the house with us. This morning, I came back home. My mom me something that has me coming here for answers. She said when she was helping my grandma out of the car that night, she saw something walk through the backyard. She said the best word she could use to describe it was werewolf. She said it was tall, gangly, and on all fours with a shine. She has also felt the unclean feeling. I know a little bit about skinwalkers, and what she described sounded a lot like one. I also study the paranormal, so I'm also of a negative spirit as the culprit. If it is a skinwalker, would Catholic prayers and blessings work, or do I need something else? This is a true story. It happened to me just over a decade and a half ago. I don't know if this is the wrong sub for this sort of thing. If so, please let me know and I'll gladly move it. The title is borrowed from one of the stories my uncle used to tell me when I stayed with him and my cousin when I was young. The title has nothing really to do with the story per se, other than it happened to be the one he was telling when this story happened. I have went back and forth a couple of times on whether or not to post this. Partially because I know most won't believe it, and partially because I don't really want to relive it in my head. Throw away because no amount of karma is worth getting labeled a whack job should someone I know in real life find this or something. My uncle we will call him, Bob, and his daughter, my cousin we will call her Sue, used to live a good distance out in the woods. I'm not going to say what state, but suffice it to say it's a very rural area of a southeastern U.S. state. The closest main road was a couple of miles away, and it was one gravel road onto another to get to their house. The only house within walking distance, a long walk at that, about an one-eighth of a mile, was a second uncle of mine, John. And the two of them had lived in that house in the middle of those woods all of their lives up until Bob decided to buy a mobile home and set it up a little farther still into the woods. Yeah, it probably sounds nuts so to want to live out in the middle of no frickin' where. The town's TV cable service didn't even offer service to his house, and you could barely get a cell signal there half the time, but my uncle loved it. He was an outdoorsy type, and honestly a bit of a gun nut. He fancied himself a cowboy, I guess always wearing a cowboy hat and watching old gunslinger TV shows on VHS, like I said, no cable. My cousin Sue never knew anything different, so she liked living out in the woods just fine too, up until they moved into the trailer. But more on that later. So, being a young boy, I thought my Uncle Bob was just the coolest guy in the world. I always enjoyed shooting and plinking as a kid. My parents bought me a 22 caliber, taught me how to use it and how to safely handle firearms really young. So of course I loved visiting Uncle Bob out in the woods and going hunting with him and checking out his cool guns. That is, until both of my parents got switched to second shift at their jobs, and I had to start going to Bob's house after school every day. At first it wasn't so bad, the lack of cable really bummed me out, but we had VHSs. But what really started to get to me was the walk back to my parents' car at 11.30 when they got off and came to pick me up. The gravel road that led from my Uncle John's house to Bob's was barely passable as a road, and lit by a single street light. My parents, convinced that a 12-year-old boy had nothing to worry about walking down a gravel road at midnight in the middle of nowhere, I mean, who was going to bother me, right? would usually park at John's house and call down for Bob to send me walking up the road. It honestly wasn't that big of a deal. Bob would stand at his door and watch me walk up the road to make sure I was all right, and I'd no sooner be out of his sight than the high beams of my parents' car would be greeting me back to safety. But it sure felt like I was walking through hell. Other than the TV situation and the long dark walk, Bob, Sue, and I would sit around and talk about hunting or watch videotaped hunting shows. Bob loved hunting, like hunted every single day. Both of my uncles had been hunting in those woods since they were little and knew damn near everything about the area. 
Bob had some pretty spooky stories he would tell from his hunting experiences. Mostly just weird sounds in the woods, occasionally seeing some weird things once or twice. It always tripped me out when he would tell Sue and me those stories about the woods around the trailer we were sitting in at that very moment. Of course, John would never back Bob up on any of those stories. If you asked him about any of them, or if he had ever seen anything, he'd just say something kind of dodgy about how you can't explain everything. And just because he didn't know what something was didn't mean it was anything weird. I don't remember a single time John confirmed anything Bob told me, at least not with any kind of conviction. But that is probably partially because Bob was a natural-born storyteller. He could make scary stories up off the top of his head that would give Stephen King nightmares. That was something else we did to pass the time, sit around and listen to these horror stories that my uncle would come up with. Now don't get me wrong, he never mixed up his real life. This happened to me eerie type stories with his obviously made up supernatural type stories. But knowing how John kinda shrugged Bob's true stories off, and knowing how good of a storyteller Bob was, I always took his tales with a shaker of salt. So anyway, like I said, I really liked hanging out with Uncle Bob and Cousin Sue, and going hunting with Bob and everything was pretty normal at their trailer for a good, well after they moved in. They even got an indoor dog that I loved to death and loved to play with named Muffin. I had maybe been staying with them after school for probably a month when it all went to shit. When it first started, I really kinda wondered if they were playing a joke on me, or setting up some tall tale for a story. It never seemed to happen when I was there only on the weekends, or after midnight when I had gone home. Someone was trying to screw with Sue's head. Bob would be gone during the day hunting or gone to town, and someone would F with their trailer. Knocking on doors, knocking on walls, throwing sticks, rocks at it. Now Sue was no Southern Belle. She knew her way around a 12-gauge pump-action shotgun better than most people. But one can only sit in a trailer, the middle of the woods alone, and listen to windows in other rooms getting knocked on before you start to wonder who the hell is coming all the way out in rural bum Egypt to mess with you. Not to mention the stuff happening at 2-3 o'clock in the morning. Sue and Bob had bedrooms at opposite ends of the trailer, and at either end, looking outside their window, was a clearing maybe 40-50 feet wide, and then the tree line. At night in the early hours of the morning, Sue could hear someone walking rather heavily around the wood line, and occasionally screaming a high-pitched scream. My dad and Uncle John suggested it was a panther, and not to worry about it, but Sue took to sleeping with the 12-gauge next to her bed anyway. Like I said, I honestly didn't believe it at first. I could barely muster the courage to walk from one end of the gravel road to the other at night with a fully grown man with a gun watching over me. Who the F would have the balls to be wandering around the woods at 3 a.m. screwing with an obviously armed woman? And the fact that it only happened when I wasn't there seemed a little too convenient. I would have thought maybe they were setting me up for some kind of grand story, or even that Sue she was a bit of a drama queen was just making it up for attention, except that they were kind of keeping it hush-hush, at least from me. The little bits of info I got were mostly hearing other room conversations between Sue and Bob, or Bob and John. I had to piece together what was going on, and question Sue about it later. At first, she just kind of said it was nothing for me to worry about and everything was fine. That is, until one day after school, I got to their house and Bob and Sue were waiting for me at John's house to walk me down to theirs. This was unusual. It was a perfectly bright sunny day. No murderers, rapists, or home intruders in sight. But there was something really strange in the air that day. Some weird glances between Bob and Sue. Something had them on edge. If the awkward looks and edgy acting hadn't tipped me off, the firepower should have. Bob had a six-shooter strapped to his leg and a 30-30 lever-action rifle in his hand, and Sue had the shotgun at her side. It wasn't until Bob was making us dinner in the kitchen later that I found out why. Someone had tried to break in on Sue that day. Bob had gotten up that morning and went squirrel hunting, 
and someone had tried to rip the door off of their trailer. Bob hadn't went out for a few days given the strange occurrences of the past few days, but everything had seemingly died down. So, this day he had decided he'd go out for just a little while, stick close to the trailer, and see how things went. No more than 45 minutes after he had left, Sue had been sitting on the couch and heard the handle of the door, which she had triple locked, start to rustle back and forth. Gently at first, and then harder, and finally a full-fledged attempt to pull the door off the hinges. Sue had somehow composed herself long enough to call Bob's cell phone and scream for help before grabbing the shotgun and falling into a crying mess on the floor, waiting on God knows what to come through the door after her. It had been watching and waiting on Bob to leave. It gave up a few minutes before Bob got back, either deterred by the door lock, Sue's dog Muffin attacking the inside of the door trying to get out to it, or at the sound of a shotgun's pump action racking around into the chamber. I hadn't noticed walking in I seemed to remember one of them opening the door for me, but later that day I checked and the doorknob was decimated. I'm not sure how it was hanging on, much less working, and I could tell this wasn't usual Sue drama when she told me. She was nearly in tears. Muffin would not leave her side that entire night, no matter how much I tried to play with her. She had the look in her eye of someone who had been through an emotional hell that day. After dinner, just after sundown, we tried to regain some sense of normalcy. We played a few games of sorry, a few games of cards, and were sitting down about to listen to Bob continue one of his stories, The Great Smoky Mountain Massacre, from which this story borrows its title. Sue and I sat on the couch with Muffin laying in between us. Bob sat in a chair perpendicular to us. I was honestly not in the mood to hear a scary story from Bob the Master of Terror himself after hearing what had went down that day, but Sue wanted to, so I was okay with it. I suppose maybe looking back, she wanted to put her fear back into something that couldn't really hurt her. Who knows what was outside the door, but at least in there right then. No story was breaking down her door to get at her. Five minutes in, Bob had us enthralled as usual, and I was just leaning my head back to take a sip of soda when bam, something hit the metal trailer wall directly behind my head so hard I fell out of my seat. Literally, I jumped into the floor, hit the deck, and took cover, Sue in the floor beside me, Muffin barking at the top of her lungs, Bob grabbing a rifle and a spotlight, slamming the back door open and flying out of it trying to kick Muffin back to keep her inside. I could hear very heavy footsteps hitting the ground to the tree line just behind their house. Five minutes passed, then ten, then an eternity. I remember it like it were yesterday. Finally, what seemed like hours later, but was probably fifteen minutes at most, I heard Bob yell to Sue that he was coming back in which was a good thing as Sue by now had a firearm in hand. He walked back in with disbelief in his eyes. He hadn't made it around the house in time to see what had hit the wall, but the area where the bang was heard, the area just behind my head, was about ten feet off the ground. There was a dent in the metal the size of an abnormally large man's fist, no more than a foot behind where my head had just been only minutes ago, and my Uncle Bob who until that point in my life had been the great white hunter to me, had no explanation. Bob and Sue walked me to my parents' car that night. Of course my parents, being rational human beings, and knowing Bob's storytelling and Sue's flair for the dramatic didn't believe it was anything other than perhaps a peeping Tom or some backwards neighbor who had no fear of death via acute lead poisoning and nothing to do but walk several miles in the middle of the night to bang on a trailer and run trying to scare us. It didn't matter if they believed me, though. Just as quickly as the terrorizing had started, it stopped. A month or so passed, and there were no more incidents to speak of, or at least nothing that couldn't be blamed on overactive imaginations or jumpy nerves. No more window taps, no more muffin barking fits, no more replaced doorknobs. Still, the occurrence made Bob decide that maybe they should cut back a few trees and extend the wood line away from their house a bit, if for nothing else than to extend the sight lines just in case. 
So they hired a couple of guys to come in during the days with chainsaws and cut some of the trees around the edges of the clearing down. They were friends of the family, so they worked slow, but it gave Bob some time to get some hunting in, trusting that no sane or even insane individual would try breaking in on Sue midday while guys with chainsaws running full blast were walking around. And he was right, no weird activity at all to speak of. Until, one Sunday night, a few weekends later. I wasn't there for this part, but it is what I am able to recall piecing together the next day from my 12-year-old brain, now over a decade and a half later. Muffin, being an indoor dog, and needing to go outside as indoor dogs often do, was sitting next to the front door with her leash, sometime just after dark. Bob, not having me to send out to walk her, and still a bit anxious from the strange happenings the month before, grabbed his rifle and flashlight, put Muffin's leash on her, and plunged out into the warm, dark night. Sue was inside washing dishes from dinner and looking out into the yard, newly cleared area, and was just able to faintly see Bob and Muffin from the little bit of glow the gravel road streetlight provided. Almost no sooner than her paws had hit the dirt, Muffin flipped her shit. She was a small dog, maybe 20 pounds, but she was hitting above her weight barking and pulling Bob toward the tree line with everything she had. Bob was no small man by any means, but trying to balance a flashlight in one hand with a dog leash tied around it, and a rifle in the other. I guess it is fair to say that Muffin was winning the fight. After getting Muffin to stop yanking his arm out of socket, Bob tried to shine his flashlight at the tree line to see what Muffin was barking at, but the beam wouldn't quite reach. All he could see at the distance was what looked like a very thick tree stump the yard clearing had left. And then, the tree stump stood up. Sue, inside at the kitchen window and being a lot closer than Bob to the end of the house, yard the former tree stump was now standing at, said the figure was tall and very bulky. Tall meaning over eight foot in height, and bulky as in. As wide around as a large tree stump. The massive figure took a step toward Bob just as the first before the first shot rang out, and then the second and the third, and so on. The hulking shade, possibly startled by the noise of a 30-30 Winchester, or possibly hit with a round or several, turned and retreated back into the woods. At first Bob and the fearless Muffin started toward the woods to give chase and find out just what the hell that tree stump had morphed into. However, after a few steps, and realizing he had no idea how many rounds he had left in his rifle, Bob thought better of chasing an obviously physically superior, possibly wounded, animal, into the deep dark woods in the pitch black of night, regardless of how much courage Muffin possessed. Instead, after a quick reload, the night was spent at Uncle John's house. The next day John and Bob went to look at the scene of the carnage. Brush and small trees were knocked down for yards leading deeper into the woods back over a creek and towards a bluff. But the trail went cold, and there were no obvious signs of blood. So, just what was terrorizing my uncle and my cousin? I have no idea. I do know I talked to John about it a little over a year later, after my uncle and cousin had moved out of that house and into a more populated, less rural part of town. I asked John what he thought it was, and if he thought the story was just Bob embellishing for the sake of a good tale, or Sue playing everything up for attention. John's usual casual disregard for Bob's stories wasn't there this time. He just said he didn't know and he didn't think he ever would. John actually moved into the trailer after Bob and Sue moved out. Never had any problems as far as I know. Not a peep. You may be wondering what finally made my uncle and my cousin move out between the tree stump night and the time I talked to John about everything. What was it that finally made someone who had lived within an one eight-mile radius from their childhood home their whole life, and who loved living in the middle of nowhere, finally pack up and move to a less rural area across town? Well, unfortunately for me, that is where I come in. It had been probably six or seven months since my Uncle Bob had shot at some towering behemoth of an unidentifiable human-ish-shaped animal. 
They had speculated just what that shape in the darkness had been for months. Maybe it was a really, really large human. Maybe it was a bear. Black bears are pretty common around here, and one standing on its hind legs for a minute would appear like a stump getting huge, especially in the panic of the moment. Nobody knew. It didn't really matter, though. Either Bob had hit it with enough lead to poison a fishing village, or it had decided it wasn't fond of getting shot at. Either way, it hadn't been back to bother my cousin or my uncle. Bob almost never left the first two months, especially without Sue. In the third month, he started cautiously going out, but staying close, and as things tend to do, they started to go back to normal. Finally, after over half a year, Bob was going out almost every day hunting again. Summer had come and gone, and I had decided to spend a Saturday hunting with my uncle. Sue seemed perfectly fine staying alone again. I think she was sick of Bob being there all the time. So Bob and I decided to make a go of it and have it some squirrels. My parents had just gotten me my first shotgun, a single shot break action 20 gauge. We walked for maybe a mile and a half, which takes a little while when you are trying to be quit in the woods, and we were just crossing a fence onto a neighboring property. My uncle was friends with the owner and had permission to cross the property as a shortcut when my uncle's cell phone rang, which in and of itself was a miracle given the cell phone coverage of the day and how far we were in the woods. He quickly silenced it and handed my gun over the fence to me I had crossed first. We had to climb over as it was a tall fence. Just as he was about to hand his gun over, the phone began to ring again. Bob pulled the phone out of his jacket and looked at it, answered and was just about to say, Sue, I can't talk right now, when I could hear it over his speaker. Loud banging on metal, bang, 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 Muffin barking her head off, Sue screaming for help. Grabbing his gun and slamming his phone into his pocket, Bob took off running back in the direction of their house. Leaving me on the wrong side of the fence, Bob yelled, He'll be back, stay here. At this point, I believe I was 12 or 13 years old. The exact details kind of blur with time, but the event I can still close my eyes and relive if I am not careful. Bob running as fast as he can through the woods rifle in hand, his brown jacket getting smaller and smaller into the distance until I'm alone. I'm alone in the woods, not old enough to drive, barely a teenager, not even in high school yet. I'm alone in the woods, no one around for miles, with a single shot shotgun and a pocket full of shells as my uncle speeds off to defend my cousin from God, only knows what kind of monster my imagination was coming up with. I had never even seen the silhout that they had been so afraid of, only heard their descriptions and juxtaposed them to the sound of the banging coming from behind my head that night, ten feet off the ground. I was alone in the woods, in Muffin, all twenty pounds of her was trying every bit as hard to get out to tear the monster's throat out to protect my cousin, but I was here almost defenseless. I was alone in the woods, and I was scared to death. Put your twelve-year-old self there. Put your twelve-year-old self in the woods, alone, with the monsters and the demons, and every creature from under your bed, and stuck imagining what was going on a mile away. Up until that moment, I had never been scared of the woods, but right then, I just wanted to get out. At first, I was able to stay pretty calm and collected. I carefully unloaded the single round in my shotgun after taking a good five-minute glare around the area to make sure I wouldn't need that single round immediately. Slid the gun under the fence, clumb over the fence myself, and then reloaded. I wanted to get out of there so badly. I knew roughly the way back. But honestly, I wasn't sure I wanted to go back to my uncle's house, given its current situation, either. I figured it, I followed the trail most of the way to his house, then veered off left to my Uncle John's house. It would be at least moderately safe. At least a lot safer than waiting around here for Bob to scare off whatever was trying to break in on Sue again, just for it to come out here and find me wandering around. At least she had a house, a dog, and an arsenal of Bob's firearms to protect her. Hell, I only had one round at a time. So, weighing the risk of getting in trouble for not staying put like Bob told me to versus the risk of getting eaten by Bigfoot. 
I started down the trail back to John's house. At best, I run into Bob coming back for me. At worst, I get to John's and call Bob's cell phone and let him know where I am. And at very worst, I run headlong into Sasquatch and have to fight for my life with what would be the equivalent of a BB gun to it. At first, the walk was almost peaceful. Birds chirping, squirrels running about, they always know when you aren't going to shoot them for some reason, and that's when they'll run out in front of you. I say walk because it started out kind of a brisk speed walk sort of thing. As fast as I could without crushing through the brush and announcing my presence to whatever was within earshot. But then, something changed. There were no bird sounds anymore. No little animal noises at all. Just a steady, heavy crunching of foliage underfoot. And it wasn't by me. Something coming toward me that was just out of sight. It couldn't be Bob, it is coming from the direction I'm coming from, but behind me, walking with me toward Bob's house. Okay, F this, I'm out. I remember thinking under my breath as I broke into whatever I could manage for a sprint in the heavier underbrush. A minute into my sprint, I started thinking I was silly. There is no way anything is behind me. After all, isn't this whole thing just Bob and Sue's imagination anyway? Their imagination now chasing me through the woods, and I still hear it following me. Something is still crunching away just as fast as I am, keeping pace with me in these godforsaken woods. By the time I hit the clearing to John's yard, I don't know if whatever it was was still keeping pace with me, or catching up, or gone completely. For all I knew, and in my imagination, the second I hit the clearing, its giant arm was going to grab me and snatch me back into the bleakness of the forest forever. Propelled by that thought and gaining traction in the clearing, I didn't stop running until I was pounding on John's door with everything I had. When he finally got me inside and calmed me down, he explained that whatever had been breaking in on Sue was gone when he and Bob got there. Sue had called John too and that Bob had just went back into the woods a few minutes ago to find me meaning there is no way it could have been him following me. John called Bob and let him know I was safe and sound, and a few long months after that day, as soon as they could afford to get out, Sue and Bob moved away from that trailer in the middle of the woods. As far as I know, after that day they never had any more problems. However, on their last day there, Bob told me he joked to Sue he was going to leave a forwarding address on the door so their visitor would know where to find her. Somehow the humor of that one was lost on her. I'm a ranger in Yosemite National Park, and I believe I've witnessed something that people refer to as a real-life alien spaceship. I even had the audacity to touch it with my bare hands. It was a few years back when I was still quite new to the job, on May 7, 2003 to be exact. I was assigned to patrol an area due to reports of strange sounds being heard every night past midnight. There were also rumors of dazzling light shows resembling full laser displays. Some speculated that teenagers were having parties in the woods as the reason behind these noises. But deep down, I knew that explanation didn't make any sense. A couple of rangers had already been investigating the case, but with little progress. That's when I was added to the team. At 23 years old, full of enthusiasm to solve the mystery, I delved into every aspect of the investigation. I meticulously gathered testimonies from witnesses, surveyed the entire area, and tracked possible suspects. I even started camping in the suspected sites. Night after night, I immersed myself in the darkness of the woods, becoming intimately familiar with the creatures that emerged when the sun set. I witnessed unexplainable phenomena and unexplained disappearance of a human right before my eyes, insects glowing with a mesmerizing flicker of light. I documented everything, but unfortunately, in 2003, phone cameras were not as accessible as they are now so I had no clear evidence of these extraordinary occurrences. It was during the last night at the final location on the list when everything changed. As the clock neared five, I was setting up camp when suddenly, all my gadgets emitted strange static noises. 
Initially, I considered the possibility of equipment failure and thought about heading back. But something felt off. The day before, everything was functioning perfectly fine. Nonetheless, after a few minutes, the strange static ceased and everything returned to normal. With little hope of finding answers, I shared my discoveries with my fellow rangers. Some believed me, while others laughed it off. To those who believed, they mentioned having witnessed similar phenomena, but failing to find any trace of it upon returning to investigate. It seemed to appear and vanish in the right place at the right time, defying rational explanation. With a glimmer of hope, I returned to the exact spot where the specter had presented itself. I moved around the area, searching every nook and cranny, but to no avail. It was truly gone. As I sat down to have my dinner, the full moon cast its radiant glow, illuminating the surroundings. Lost in my thoughts, I caught a sudden flash of light in my peripheral vision. It was momentary, but it showed me the way. Intrigued, I followed the direction of the light, and soon enough, my walkie-talkie began emitting an intense, unsettling static noise. Fearing it might alert whatever entity was responsible, I swiftly turned it off. With a mix of excitement and trepidation, I scoured the area until, finally, at around 10 p.m., I stumbled upon an awe-inspiring sight. Before me floated a colossal structure resembling an egg with rings like Saturn, slowly ascending into the night sky. Its metallic surface emitted an otherworldly glow, reflecting the moon's light. I hid behind a nearby tree, my heart pounding in my chest. This was it. This was the revelation of an unseen side of our world, and I was an astonished witness to it. Crouching down, I observed the object with bated breath. It hovered, surrounded by its rotating rings, an enigmatic spectacle. It was pitch black, and its presence emanated a deep engine-like rumble. I marveled at its presence, captivated by the sheer magnitude of the moment. Suddenly, the stillness shattered as the outer shell of the object began to crack. The rings on its surface emitted a neon blue light, reminiscent of an ethereal glow. It was a sight beyond comprehension, defying any earthly explanation. My eyes remained fixated on the spectacle as four metallic pipes extended from the craft, acting as sturdy supports. It stood there, frozen in place, and I dared not make a sound. Time seemed to blur as I crouched there, overwhelmed by a mixture of awe and fear. Hours passed, but nothing else transpired. The cracks on the surface of the object closed, returning it to its original form. An eerie stillness settled over the surroundings as the craft slowly began to rise, its presence dominating the night sky. Driven by curiosity and a thirst for answers, I mustered the courage to approach the vessel cautiously. Every movement was deliberate as I crawled on all fours, avoiding any unnecessary noise. With each painstaking inch, I drew closer to the enigmatic craft, anticipation surging through my veins. Finally, I reached out, extending my hand to touch the metallic surface. The sensation was surreal, a smooth, cool texture beneath my fingertips. It was a moment of connection, a tangible encounter with the unknown. However, as I prepared to caress the craft, a high-pitched noise pierced the air, reverberating through my eardrums. The intensity was overwhelming, causing me to clutch my ears in agony. The next thing I knew, I awakened in a hospital bed, disoriented and bewildered. I had been found unconscious by a fellow ranger and rushed to the hospital when I failed to regain consciousness. The details surrounding my sudden collapse remained a mystery but I knew deep down that my encounter with the otherworldly craft had played a part. Since that fateful day, I've become even more determined to uncover concrete evidence of their existence. The encounter, the warning signal of the high-pitched noise, and the subsequent disappearance of the craft all reinforced my belief that these beings walked among us, observing from the shadows. They were aware of our presence, and perhaps they had become more cautious, making their activities less frequent and conspicuous. Armed with my conviction, I continue my search for proof, hoping to share my extraordinary experiences with those willing to listen. The encounter with the alien ship had forever altered my perception of the world, reminding me that there is still so much left to uncover. As a ranger in Yosemite National Park, 
I stand as a guardian of the uncharted, forever vigilant, and forever seeking answers to the mysteries that lie within the vastness of the unknown. I work for a security company. We install CCTV on construction sites. One night about 2 a.m. our response officer gets a call from the monitoring station to say there's a guy walking around one of the buildings under construction. They described him as tall, dressed in all black with his hood up, but couldn't see his face because he had his back to the camera. He wasn't stealing or vandalizing, just wandering around usually homeless looking for shelter. So the response goes to investigate. When he gets there, there's nobody around. So he asks the station to check the camera covering the only way in or out of the building to see which direction he went. Nothing. He does a full patrol of the site and there's no trace of anyone. The only other way for this guy to get out was to shimmy down the scaffolding and he could be hurt so the officer asks the station to do a check on all of the camera footage through the night. Nothing. The next day, we asked the station to send over the stills from when they initially picked the intruder up. He's not on any of them. Just footage of our response officer waking around. We were pretty freaked out talking about it in the office, and it was laughed off as the monitoring officer being sleepy and seeing things, except the cameras we use have IR beams, and they only alert the monitoring station when someone breaks them. It was a 2 a.m. type late on a Friday night after a party. Me and her both 18 are at the local state park admiring the moonlight and each other's private parts at the lakeside. I hear slow calculated footsteps behind us. The kind of slow that makes you think someone is trying to hide their approach. I don't remember if it was crunchy leaves or what that gave them away, but I'm just glad I turned around. I look back and see two shadow figures were there, coming towards us from the road and maybe 50 yards away. My car was behind them, and we are definitely the only people in the entire park at this time late at night. I stand up and I say out loud something like, guys, what's up? They don't respond but keep moving towards us until I say to them with a little more tension, stop moving. They stop maybe 30 feet from us and are a little more visible now. One's got a tank top and camo pants, the other has full camo pants and jacket and what I'm pretty sure was a black paintball mask. Tank top guy starts with, hey guys, sorry we didn't mean to scare you, then says they were just noticing my car parked there illegally and that cops ticket all the time here at night. So I said thank you for letting us know, but then they didn't move. Awkward silence. I said, great thank you. Again and still nothing except Tank Top tried to talk about parking tickets again. I noticed Paintball Mask had his hands stuffed in his jacket pockets, so I thought it was time to ask him to remove them. Another awkward silence. Of course he didn't, so I asked him again. Another silence. He finally removed them and that was it. The guys walked away and kind of just disappeared into the woods. We ran to our car spooked and couldn't stop checking in the rear view mirror, the whole way out of the park. We checked the computer when we got home and find out all kinds of complaints were being made there about assaults on couples at night. In the 80s there was a serial murderer on couples there too who'd never been caught. All around spooky and until now I have unnecessary laser focus hearing behind me at night. Fifteen years ago, I went camping with two school friends in Bushland that backed onto my dad's property in Wari Yalik, Australia. My dad didn't spend much time at the house, but said we could use it as a base to dump any gear we might not need. He also gave me a heads up that he might creep up to our campsite that night and scare the guys I was with. We hiked from the house for about four hours through very dense bush, where we found a clearing and decided to set up our camp. Looking around the place for firewood, we kept turning up a lot of old bones. Some so old they almost looked like wood. We concluded that due to the land once being used for farming, it was likely they were cow bones. We came up with a few more theories for the sake of scaring each other, then built our fire, even burning a couple of the wood-like bones just to see what would happen and settled in. 
I was woken up by one of my buddies at about 1 a.m. who said he swears he saw torchlight on the tent wall. Excellent, I thought. We sat in silence for a few minutes before the light came back. This was great. I really hammed it up, making up stories about murders in the area and escaped prisoners. The light from the torch fixed on our tent, then switched off. We could hear leaves and sticks moving around outside and my buddies were on the verge of tears. Then we started hearing whispering outside, as well as some low mumbling. Dad had brought some friends in on the prank, dedicated. The torch light came back on and pressed right up to the tent wall, and a hand began tapping across the top while the whispering continued. My dad had brought some friends in on the prank and convinced them to walk four hours through dense scrub in the middle of the night just to shine a torch on our tent. I started to panic. Then it just stopped completely, about an hour after it began. We sat in total silence aside from the sobbing of my buddies, and at dawn packed up and got the F out. We got back to the house and Dad was there. He apologized and said he'd planned to come out and see us last night, but fell asleep at his girlfriend's house. We told him about what happened, and he was genuinely dumbfounded. Interestingly, I went back to the spot a couple of years ago after telling this story to a friend. We found a small shack made of corrugated iron pockmarked with bullet holes, a 44-gallon drum full of burned clothes, a pile of firewood, and two axes. Who knows if it's related, but it was creepy. Spent a week with a Shur family in the Amazon about 15 miles from Chon, Ecuador. Little background. Three of us gringo medical pre-medical students were staying with them on a medical education rotation, learning about traditional remedies. It was a blast. We stayed in a, in a separate shelter from the family, and the walls of our shelter was decorated with giant snakeskins and tiger skins those beasts that had wandered too close to camp over the years. The jungle is a loud place to sleep. Millions of animals and insects clamor all night long, and it blends into a sort of peaceful cacophony. After the gunshot rang out at 3 a.m., the cacophony was gone. Absolute silence. It was the scariest sound I had ever heard. We clung to my two and knife, telling ourselves that it would protect us from whatever was coming. We cowered across from the entrance to our shelter, awaiting what was to come certain a tiger was lurking, or that our lovely hosts had decided they were sick of us. We sat and shivered through the night. The silence was terrifying. When the sun rose and we finally felt confident enough to venture outside, it turned out an unlucky capybara wandered through camp during the night. Poor little bugger got shot in the face at 3 a.m. and was the first meat we had eaten all week by 7 a.m. Tasted like greasy venison. I'll never forget that night or that lovely family. In 28, I was in the Navy. We were 100 plus miles from any land. It was about 3, 4 a.m. off the coast of Peru. I was an electronics technician, so I worked in radio with one other guy, a radio man, and we just sat up scanning on HF, UHF and VHF radios listening for drug runners. We intercepted a UHF signal that played a short piano preamble, followed by a haunting, computerized-sounding woman's voice reading numbers. 11, 9, 4, 6, etc. This went on for about a minute, then the preamble repeated followed by the same number sequence, then it was gone. We recorded the transmission, wrote the numbers down, informed the captain, and shortly a message was sent off to the area commander about the strange message. The reply we received was to disregard. Creep me right the F out. I came to find out that this is a numbers station, and while the phenomenon is not entirely understood, it's likely a method for getting a secure message or code to an intelligence agent in the field over an insecure method of communication. Since the numbers could be attached to a one-time code, it's basically indecipherable. From May 2010 to May 2011, I worked as a security guard at a hydroelectric dam in Virginia. It was a fairly isolated location. 
If you needed an ambulance, you could expect at least a 20-minute wait. About a month after I was hired, one of the guys at the dam told me that most security guards out there quit after a few days because they got so creeped out being alone at the dam at night, and he was glad I was sticking it out. In truth, it could be creepy. Sometimes at night, when I was patrolling the basement level of the dam itself, I'd think about the fact that I was 50 feet below the water line on the low side, the only human being in about a mile and a half radius. Sometimes I'd hear weird noises in the woods or catch a flash of a shadow while I was inside the dam. It takes a lot to scare me though, and I knew I was either hearing critters in the woods or my mind was playing tricks on me. One night, however, something happened that scared the living hell out of me. It was a little after 11 p.m. and I was sitting in the guardhouse reading a book. Suddenly, I heard a tap at the door. What was creepy about the guardhouse at night was that when you had the lamp inside turned on, people could look through the windows at you, but the glare made it difficult for you to see outside. When I heard the tap at the door, I thought it was a bug hitting the glass. It was so faint, and I knew there weren't any contractors at the dam. I had the place to myself. Then the tap came again, more insistent this time. I grabbed my flashlight and opened the door. There was no one there. Then I let the door slip from my hand and shut behind me. To my left, previously concealed by the door as I had opened, it was a huge man, at least 400 pounds, wearing a gray sweatshirt and gray sweatpants. The sweatshirt was smeared with fresh blood. My heart started hammering. My blood ran cold. I was so scared I couldn't speak. As it turns out, he was a local fisherman who had been fishing off the bridge over the tail race, and he was wondering why the power company hadn't started back pumping into the lake yet, because they usually started a little before 11, and that was what always drew in the big striped base. He was smeared with blood because he'd already caught and gutted a couple and wiped his hands on his shirt. He felt really bad when he realized that he had approached me basically in the same way that a murderer in a horror movie would have. I am thankful to this day that I was unarmed security, because if I'd had a gun, I would have either shot him or accidentally shot myself while trying to shoot him. I was deer hunting on some private land. In back of me was another hunter who had built himself a blind out of straw bales on a slight hill. It was early in the morning when I saw a reddish dog loping at the other end of the field going across our field of view. The stupid idiot started firing his gun at the dog thinking it was a deer. Unfortunately, he was also firing over my head. I could hear the snap of the 30 of six bullets over my head. It was obvious he couldn't hit the ground with his hat, so I carefully moved away from the line of fire. Later that morning crouched in a low dip, some other idiot started firing his gun at something, the bullets rattling the leaves above my head. I was all done after that. Gave my guns to my son and never set a foot in the woods again during deer season. A few years ago, maybe four or five years, I heard a knock on my door. I live in a large apartment complex with a dozen other tenants. Remembering this almost feels like a dream when I try to recall it now. I remember going to the door and opening it up, and there were two men in suits. I want to say they had sunglasses on, but I honestly don't know if that's me just misremembering. Maybe I'm just thinking of the classic men in black scenario, and it's morphing with my actual memory. Either way, I don't remember their features at all, really. But they were definitely in suits. All they did was ask me one question, and it was something like, Hey, does this person live here? Do you know this person? I remember just saying no, and they were like, okay, and I assumed they thanked me and left. As lame as this sounds, I'm actually a bit frazzled as I type this because I know this happened, but I can't remember a lot of it for some reason. Looking back, I'm not sure why I didn't find this more odd or didn't share it with anyone. I don't even know what I'm doing here, but I guess I want to get this memory out somewhere. Thanks for listening. Just the other night, I came home to find one of my mounts had fallen from the wall. 
Later that night my IR sensor came unglued from the same wall and fell off. At the time this happened no one was home and the AC heat was off. I built the house new and moved in about five months ago. The mount was one of the first thing I hung on the wall. It hangs on a half dry wall screw which was still solid in the wood plank wall backed by three quarters plywood about 12 feet from the floor on an interior wall. The bracket on back of the mount was also good. A little creepy. We got to where the first thing we do when we get home is to see if the mount is still on the wall. Not sure if I believe in ghosts, but I have several stories that make me believe there is something going on in the background. I have on several occasions had weird unexplained experiences in several different places. After a while makes you start questioning yourself. I was camping in upstate New York a week after two prisoners escaped. This was a high notoriety escape and was national news. My girlfriend and I had hiked and camped for two days before this. We were very comfortable, had met a lot of awesome people, but everyone was on alert of the escapees. We had settled in, in a remote area upstate New York with no one around that night. I was sound asleep that night. At 5.30 a.m. I had started to awake, but stayed in my tent, not trying to awake, but to maybe go back to sleep for an hour or two. Not long after I was awake did I hear rustling in the woods around our campsite. At first it was a few rustles, which caught my attention, but not enough to be alarmed. Suddenly, the rustles are right outside our tent, and I am on edge. Before I could even tap my girlfriend, all hell breaks loose. My tent is slashed open with a knife while I am watching. My heart almost went through my throat. Before I knew what was happening, I was being pile-driven into the ground by men with guns. Thankfully, I had noticed in the seconds that the men had police armor on. I started screaming out my name, my address, my social security number. Everything. My girlfriend was even jumped on and forcefully subdued while she was sleeping. Once everyone's adrenaline calmed down, we showed our IDs and proved we were just camping. It was one of the scariest moments of my life, and also for the police officers that subdued us. Turns out we were not far from where they were just spotted, and the police hadn't come across anyone in days. They had thought for sure they had come upon the escapee's camp. Two deputy sheriffs believe that they have seen a tall, dark figure just outside the city limits of Oceanside, California. They both stated that they were viewing this creature standing on the other side of an eight-foot tall chain-link fence. The officers state they saw it moving its head back and forth, as if looking around at the area. This is when one of the deputies decides to go get his light for more illumination. When he returned, he says that whatever it was on the other side of the fence had moved off into some bushes out of sight range, leaving him with no idea of what he had just witnessed. Another sighting comes from two teenagers who were driving alongside Beach Boulevard in Oceanside on the 14th. They spotted what they thought was a bear on the side of the road, but this soon proved to be incorrect. One of the teens stated that he got out his light, shined it at the thing, only to find that there were no eyes. This is when they both ran back to their car and took off in fear, not wanting to see any more. During November of 2012, there had also been numerous UFO sightings all across California. Could these so-called sightings be related somehow? People are always reporting strange lights over cities here in America. What makes these reports any different? What do you think about all these weird happenings taking place today? Is this some sort of warning or sign for humans? Or are people simply making these up because we're desperate for attention? They went on to mention that there were several people that had filed reports of tall dark figures in the area. They also stated that they were not sure if these incidents were connected, but it seems highly possible since they occurred on the same day. Now our final report comes from yet another deputy from Graham County, Arizona. He states that while he was on duty around 3 in the morning, he heard a very strange noise coming from outside this location. When he went to investigate what the sound could have been, he says there was a tall, dark figure standing out there in front of him, near an old abandoned meat facility. 
What makes this sighting even more interesting is that this site was surrounded by open fields and little else. There is no way possible for somebody to hide out there. So what was this thing doing just standing there, staring at the deputy? When asked why he didn't do anything to apprehend it or even fire upon it, he said that he felt paralyzed with fear. He claims that his mind was telling him one thing, but his body would simply not listen. This is when he went back inside the building, calling for backup. When other deputies arrived on location, they could find no sign of any type of activity taking place. There were also no footprints found near the fence line or anywhere else throughout the dirt road leading up to where this creature had been seen standing. Imagine living in a world where you fear everything around you. You never know if something is lurking in the shadows or waiting for its next victim. Those are the people who have to live with this kind of anxiety all the time. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to live in a world where every dark corner could hold some unseen danger? What if there was something out there that was watching every move, hiding when needed, only to return once again when you least expect it, to strike without any warning? These are just some questions that many individuals could ask themselves whenever they hear stories about strange sightings taking place somewhere in or near their own city. Every day somebody else is coming forward, claiming that they have seen something out of this world or not quite human in appearance. Whether these claims are true or not is anybody's guess at this point. But what if one day, whatever is hiding in the shadows decides that we are not the ones who should be living on this planet anymore? That is a very deep and creepy thought to ponder about during one's downtime. Hopefully, these stories of strange encounters will just turn out to be lurking in the shadows and not actually be true. I was one of the naval officers fortunate enough to serve near Key West, where our days were filled with maritime duties and the constant vigilance that comes with protecting our nation's waters. It was a day like any other, with the sun casting its golden rays upon the endless expanse of ocean before us. As our motor launch smoothly cut through the gentle waves, our attention was abruptly captured by a sight that defied all reason. Suspended above the water, gleaming in the sunlight, was a cigar-shaped object unlike anything we had ever encountered. It hovered there, a silent enigma against the backdrop of the vast blue horizon. The bewilderment that gripped our hearts was soon interrupted by the arrival of a fighter plane, seemingly materializing out of thin air. With a swift maneuver, it darted toward the unidentified object, causing it to retreat into the heavens, vanishing in mere seconds. The abrupt departure left us stunned, our minds racing to comprehend the inexplicable events that had just unfolded before our eyes. Our motor launch eventually returned to the safety of the dock, the weight of our encounter weighing heavily upon our minds. To our astonishment, as soon as we disembarked, we found ourselves surrounded by a group of men clad in dark suits. Their presence exuded an air of authority, their steely gazes leaving little room for doubt. They swiftly took control of the situation, subjecting us to an interrogation that felt more like an attempt to discredit us than to seek the truth. Hours passed, filled with probing questions and skeptical glances, as if our accounts were nothing more than figments of an overactive imagination. The men in dark suits seemed determined to cast doubt upon our credibility, painting our remarkable experience as a fabrication or a misinterpretation of natural phenomena. The weight of their skepticism grew heavier with each passing moment, their relentless pursuit of discrediting our claims becoming more apparent. We were left to wonder, why were they so eager to silence our voices? What was it about our encounter that threatened their carefully constructed narratives? The truth remained tantalizingly out of reach, hidden behind a veil of secrecy and doubt. Though we were released from their clutches, their questioning left an indelible mark upon our memories. We were left with more questions than answers, forever haunted by the enigma that had unfolded over the waters near Key West. In the years that followed, we shared our story with those willing to listen, knowing that the truth deserved to be heard. We refused to let our voices be silenced, determined to shed light on the extraordinary events that unfolded before our eyes. 
To this day, the memory of that hovering object and the subsequent interrogation lingers within us, a testament to the profound mysteries that lie just beyond the veil of what we consider to be reality. And though our credibility may have been questioned, our conviction remains unyielding, reminding us that some truths are meant to be known, regardless of the attempts to suppress them. I must preface this story by assuring you that every word I'm about to share is true. It was an unimaginable thing that I, Jake, a father of two girls and an occasional outdoorsman, experienced deep in the heart of a remote mountain town near Texas. This is a story of a hunting trip gone horribly wrong, where my companions and I faced an unimaginable terror. It all began when a group of 11 seasoned hunters, including myself, gathered in the rustic town. The crisp autumn air carried whispers of elusive elk roaming the treacherous wilderness. Determined to conquer the challenge, we set out on an expedition to a hidden, unmarked location deep within the woods. As we trekked further into the wilderness, excitement coursed through our veins. However, our enthusiasm quickly waned as our compass inexplicably malfunctioned. The needle spun aimlessly, leaving us disoriented and vulnerable. A sense of unease settled upon us, as if unseen eyes were watching our every move. Undeterred, we pushed forward, relying on our instincts and experience. But the woods grew denser, and an eerie silence enveloped the landscape. Branches creaked underfoot, and the rustling of leaves seemed to echo with an otherworldly presence. Suddenly, chaos erupted. We scattered, separated by the onslaught of an enormous creature that emerged from the shadows. Towering and powerful, it resembled a beastly figure akin to Bigfoot, but far more menacing in stature. Panic gripped our souls as it hunted us down, one by one, with ruthless efficiency. I fought for my life with every ounce of strength and survival instinct I possessed. In a fierce battle, I managed to best the creature, but the victory was hollow. As its life force dissipated, it inexplicably evaporated, leaving only a pile of bones as a haunting testament to its existence. Bloodied and battered, I emerged as the sole survivor of the harrowing encounter. Determined to escape this hellish nightmare, I pressed on, searching for any sign of civilization. Exhaustion threatened to consume me as I wandered aimlessly through the dense foliage. And then, as if guided by some unseen force, I stumbled upon a surreal sight hidden within the woods, a set of stairs, seemingly out of place amidst the natural surroundings. Driven by desperation, I climbed those stairs, not knowing what lay ahead. To my astonishment, as I reached the top, I found myself standing in the very camp where our ill-fated journey began. It was a maddening realization, a loop in the fabric of reality itself. Time had folded in on itself, leading me back to the origin of our doomed expedition. Now, burdened with the knowledge of the horrors that unfolded in those woods, I find myself haunted by questions that may never be answered. What was the true nature of that creature? How did those stairs appear in the heart of the wilderness? Is this all just a cruel twist of fate? This story serves as a warning to those who dare venture into the unknown, for there are forces lurking in the depths of the wild that defy comprehension. As for me, I carry the weight of this experience, forever marked by the inexplicable events that transpired in that remote Texas town. My brother and I decided to go on a sailing trip. We're both Marines, so we don't get to see each other often. We made camp on a small island with a decently sized patch of trees. At 2 a.m. or so, we heard a boat coming towards us. Our fire had died down, but was still visible. This was a remote area, so it felt off that someone would be coming to our campsite. We grabbed our weapons and quietly went into the tree line. Some scraggly looking guy started rifling through our shit then started walking toward our boat with a rope. I decided to confront him, and my brother stayed back. To alert this stranger to my presence, I pumped my shotgun and asked him what the hell he was doing in our camp. Before this guy could say anything, I heard another guy in the darkness beyond the fire scream for me to drop my gun, or he would kill me. Before I could react, my brother opened fire on the second guy, 
and I shot the first guy. I retreated back to the tree line, and my brother asked if I was good. I told him I was all right. We did a perimeter sweep, gathered our shit, and destroyed, sank their boat. When we got back to shore, we contacted the state police and told them what happened. They detained us until our story could be cleared, then released us. So glad we decided to go together, or there's a good chance one of us could have been killed. Edit. To clarify, both died after being shot. We sank the boat in case there were any others that hid after the initial confrontation to avoid being followed. We didn't take their boat because that would have looked really bad if we got stopped on our way back my brother and I were detained until our story could be verified. Once the evidence was gathered and processed, we were released. We found out the men had been convicted of assault and burglary multiple times. We were never charged with anything, but sought legal counsel in case it did happen. To those messaging me saying I'm a coward or murderer, put yourself in the situation we were in. A stranger comes to our camp, starts stealing, and when confronted, his accomplice threatened to kill me and leveled a weapon at me. I shot because I didn't know how many others my brother might be dealing with, and I wasn't going to turn my back to someone who clearly meant harm. In the context of the situation, it was threat non-threat. In this report, I wish to remain completely anonymous. I'm a police officer and I had a sighting of a strange humanoid werewolf looking creature while patrolling a rural section of Baxter County, Arkansas. Another officer had spotted the creature at a four-way stop and I was sent to investigate. When I arrived at the location, the peculiar looking humanoid emerged and started walking across one of the roads, disappearing quickly into the nearby brush. As it turns out, this area has a long history of werewolf-type activity, along with unexplained animal deaths and disappearances. Unfortunately, I didn't have enough time to assess the creature's size before it vanished into the wooded area. I conducted a search of the location and found several sets of tracks on the dirt roads, but due to recent rainfall, they were not clear enough to determine what might have been responsible. This report is the only official complaint from an officer thus far although other officers from the same department have come forward to share their knowledge of the area. One officer even mentioned that his own grandfather had told him about a werewolf-like creature living in this vicinity. Due to its remote location, very few people ever venture there, and there had been no other reports until now. Since then, a string of stories about strange and disturbing creatures has emerged from around the world. Some reports, including those on sites like Reddit, mentioned sightings of werewolf-like creatures. While this is not a new phenomenon, as there have been reports of such beings for centuries in America, one incident stood out among the others. The incident involved a mother and child who witnessed what they believed to be a Bigfoot near their home just outside of town. They managed to position themselves with a camera and started recording. What followed would be familiar to those who have seen werewolves before. The description given resembled a dog or wolf suffering from mange, which causes hair loss and other physical ailments. However, there was an important note, the apparent foul smell emitted by this sickly looking animal. Yes, dogmen, Bigfoot and werewolves have all been associated with strong odors, and this particular sighting seemed highly likely, considering the location. Similar sightings have been reported in these parts, and the locals are aware of what they might be encountering. Another report involved two separate officers, each with their own stories about encounters while patrolling this specific part of Arkansas. Most of these encounters took place at night, and although there is little information available about them, witnesses commonly describe the creatures as being around five to six feet tall, gaunt, and thin. Glowing eyes are also frequently mentioned, which seems to be a common characteristic among these types of encounters. One officer shared that while in the same area, he observed something moving swiftly into the trees. At first, he thought it might be an animal, but then he heard another report over his radio about a Bigfoot sighting nearby. This proximity unsettled him, making him uncertain about what he had truly witnessed. In yet another report, 
a pilot flying his small plane around 5 a.m. encountered what appeared to be a massive, hairy creature. Several other pilots in the rural region of Arkansas had also spotted it. According to the officer, residents of these areas have been sharing stories for years about encountering these strange creatures, and some claim to know people who hunt them. Among the most intriguing encounters, I found one involving a police officer from Cowling County. He responded to an animal complaint near the town of De Quincey one evening. As he arrived at the scene, he saw two sets of eyes peering from behind a nearby tree, emitting an extremely bright glow. This was his first sighting of what he believed to be a huge canine-like creature. However, when it opened its mouth and let out an otherworldly growl, he backed away in fear. The officer described the creature as approximately eight feet tall, covered in dark, smoky fur. Lastly, the final sighting occurred on Highway 165 near Wilmer, where another officer had responded to a call about children claiming to have seen a Bigfoot or werewolf-like figure. According to their description, this entity had very long arms, hands resembling those of a raccoon or a human, and it was enough to frighten the officer away from the scene. At that time, I was a Presbyterian minister, visiting the bustling city of Chicago with my young son. Our purpose for being there was to explore the wonders of the Museum of Science and Industry, a place that promised to ignite our imaginations and inspire our curiosity. Little did we know that our visit would take an unexpected turn into the realms of mystery and intrigue. As we navigated the labyrinthine corridors of the museum, Marveling at the exhibits that unfolded before our eyes, we inadvertently strayed from the well-trodden path. The hallway seemed to twist and turn, leading us deeper into the heart of the building, away from the familiar attractions that drew the attention of other visitors. Lost in this maze of unfamiliar territory, we stumbled upon a room that seemed out of place, as if it existed in a different dimension from the rest of the museum. The air hung heavy with an aura of secrecy and anticipation. Our eyes were drawn to a large glass case that stood in the center, its contents obscured by a veil of curiosity. As we approached the case, our senses tingling with anticipation, we were confronted by a sight that defied explanation. Within the glass enclosure lay small humanoid bodies, their forms eerily preserved for all eternity. They possessed a delicate fragility, yet their presence emanated an otherworldly energy that sent shivers down our spines. Before we could fully process the gravity of what we were witnessing, a group of men descended upon us, their purpose as enigmatic as the beings encased in glass. They demanded my immediate attention, forcibly guiding me to a secluded corner of the room. Papers were thrust before me, demanding my signature without explanation or respite. Fear mingled with confusion as I complied, their stern gazes leaving no room for defiance. I was granted no opportunity to question or resist. The ordeal was over as abruptly as it had begun, and we were allowed to leave, the weight of secrecy heavy upon my conscience. Confounded by the enigmatic encounter, my young son and I departed the museum, carrying with us a story that defied conventional explanation. Years later, in 1974, my son, now grown, recounted the bizarre incident to Shern Larson of the Center for UFO Studies. The memories resurfaced, a reminder of the extraordinary circumstances we had encountered within the Museum of Science and Industry. The details were etched in our minds, forever ingrained in our family's history. To this day, the questions linger. What was the significance of those small humanoid bodies? Who were those men that compelled me to sign those mysterious papers? The answers remain elusive, hidden within the depths of an enigma that continues to captivate the imagination of those willing to explore the uncharted realms of possibility. On March 22, 2013, I, Officer Mike Milner, was checking out a report of missing livestock in the area around Lucachukai, Arizona. I joined Navajo officers in the search and investigation, hoping to find some clues as to where the animals had been taken. We couldn't find any dead animals initially, but Officer Larry Wanuka soon discovered heavy footprints that belonged to a single set of tracks. 
These tracks led us towards a valley nestled between two close together cliffs, and there we found the gruesome scene where the animals had been killed and taken their throats ripped open and tongues removed. I decided to climb up into one of the cliff areas, armed with my rifle, keeping watch for any signs of more of these creatures. What happened next was truly astonishing. I later shared the experience exclusively with cryptozoologists, recalling how, while I was at my post, I heard the sound of something large approaching. I couldn't see anything, but I kept hearing it get closer and closer, I recounted. I turned on my light and saw a towering, dark figure about 15 to 20 feet away. It was huge, yet its features were indistinct, no eyes, no mouth, just plain skin covering its body. It was completely naked, devoid of any identifiable gender characteristics. Before I could react, the being swiftly darted away. It was just a crazy moment. I've been working in this area for about 10 years now, and I've never heard of or seen anything like that, I added. While I mentioned the notion of skinwalkers, I must admit that I don't believe it was one. However, my knowledge of Navajo mythology and folklore is limited. Nevertheless, my department chief seems to have an idea about the identity of the creature we encountered, referring to a specific shaman. Initially, we laughed it off, I concluded. But after witnessing what this entity did to our animals, there's no doubt in my mind that it exists. It's worth noting that skinwalkers have long been a topic of speculation. While many Navajo people believe in them, state and law enforcement officials often remain skeptical. Back in 29, a viral video supposedly showing an upright walking figure stirred intrigue. It marked the first time an officer had such a close encounter with one of these creatures. In 2011, the FBI released documents about skinwalkers, but they were largely dismissed and never gained traction in the mainstream media. These leaked documents are now nearly impossible to find. When contacted, the Navajo Nation Police Department, or NNPD, offered no comment on the story. They seem to be extremely cautious about what they choose to publicize and respond to, likely aiming to downplay any rumors or accusations. Still can't explain this, I was out in the mountains of Pennsylvania in the Poconos. This happened multiple times. I would be in the woods and would hear knocking sounds on the trees around us at night. I would brush it off as just wind, but then the sounds would get louder and closer, and then they started surrounding us in a circle. It was like the way that a loading icon is and goes in a circle. We would just shut up and throw more wood on the fire. Then we heard screaming from the woods surrounding us not yelping, but in some kind of language. It was absolutely insane. It sounded like people dying. It wasn't coyotes, I've heard them one thousands of times. This was human. While the screaming and knocking kept going in circles, we would huddle near each other at the fire, looking at each other like, what the F? And it would stop after about 20 minutes. When we were in our tents, sometimes we would hear it again and hide under the blankets sometimes would even hear footsteps. This was in an area that had a lot of Native American violence, so maybe that could be why. Just grasping at straws here, because there was no way we could explain it. Whenever we went to the same area, it would happen. Edit for everyone wondering if I'm alive, lol, yes I am. We ended up staying at my friend's cabin more like a shed to be honest, and I really only stayed one night and day because two people my friends had to leave and I didn't want to be alone with the last person there whom I didn't know all that well. They were. Kinda odd to say the least, and I didn't feel right without cell service or my own car in the middle of nowhere with a stranger. Nothing out of the ordinary there though, just a campfire, some beers, grilled some food, etc. This was in a different area than the above happened, maybe that's why, but if I ever go back to the last place I will make a new post. No weird sounds that I could hear, even while venturing into the woods looking for them. But maybe someday I'll hear them again. Thanks for all the replies asking if I'm alive though, haha. Ha. I feel kinda bad how anticlimactic this was too. I really wanted to catch a recording or something, but it was just a normal camp out this time.
This evening, I'm going to be telling you about a sighting that I had back in July while working the night shift. It was just me and my partner that night. We were going around the highway right around 11 p.m., but as it turns out, our second call came in the day right around 10.40 p.m. In Ohio State Highway Patrol jurisdiction, there are no set speed limits on any roads except the turnpike and a few other select highways. So when we get calls to investigate speeders, we have to find probable causes that somebody is going above the posted speed limit. Now it was about 10.45 and I see a car passing from behind at seemingly high speeds. I didn't think much of it at first, but when I noticed the brake lights turning on and off at first, I thought somebody was just messing around. But then it became apparent this guy was trying to warn me. I turned on my lights and siren and immediately got behind this person. We were driving into a heavily forested area, so there were no lights. And it wasn't until I turned my spotlight on that I was able to see what he was trying to warn me about. There was a humanoid figure standing in the middle of the road. It appeared to be wearing all white like robes, and it did not move at all, just standing still in the road. The reason I knew this person had to have seen this thing is that he too pulled over right into the closest shoulder. As soon as he approached this thing, I get out of my car and shine my light onto this person, and it immediately sprints off into the trees like some sort of wild animal, yet completely unhuman. Despite how quickly it moved, it made no noise running or running through the brush. My partner comes up behind me, asking if I saw what he saw, and I responded with, Yeah, I did, in a very uneasy tone. Despite being unable to explain what it was that I just saw, all I can think about was getting back in our car and driving away. The other officer asked me if I wanted him to go in after it, so we could at least figure out what kind of animal it might have been. But the fact that this thing wasn't making any noise while running kind of gave me the feeling that whatever was running through those woods knew exactly where it was going, which led me to believe that chasing after it would likely be trying to catch a ghost. We didn't see anything else throughout our shift besides some drunk drivers and people purposely not wearing their seatbelts. All in all, another uneventful night besides this. Me and a buddy were doing some backcountry hiking in the Great Basin in an area where all sorts of weird shit was prone to happening. There was some restricted military base in the general area, lots of military testing and maneuvers, and lots of crazy-ass weirdos that came through that area. We crested a tall hill and were looking out over a valley when we saw two other guys on a hill across from us. I took a look at them through my binocs and they looked pretty normal. One had a rifle, but that didn't concern me because lots of people would skeet shoot and such up in that region. I decided to give them a holler and wave just to let them know we were in the area just in case they were shooting. Well, they noticed us and the guy with the rifle raised it and pointed it in our direction. I tried to dismiss it as him using his scope to be able to see us as we were pretty far away. We resume hiking and next thing I know I hear shots landing on the hill we're on. Not terribly close, but a. Eh. We hoof it down that hill and up another one and I break out the binocs again. Well, those two guys had now made it across to the hill we were on before and were skulking around the brush. F that. I decided we needed to get back to camp, but that we couldn't make a beeline because it would take us across the valley and we would be spotted in a second. I saw that there was an old, dry washout that was the perfect depth to conceal us. We snuck our way down into it, and it was literally like being in a trench surrounded by sheer dirt walls. We followed it around and out to safety, but it was pretty harrowing being in there because you couldn't see too much above, and so we had no clue where those guys were. My buddy told me a story over ice fishing this past weekend. So my boss has tons of private property in northern Michigan, and he offered to let me hunt there this year. So I took him up on the offer quickly as I've put up with central Michigan public land for years. Anyways, come September I got out there and put three hang on tree stands with screw in steps. Yeah, yeah, I know, not legal, but that's the only thing I'm comfortable climbing, and I take them out after I leave. In various locations. Q. 
Keep in mind, this is private. Nobody else is supposed to be hunting within miles of me. Fast forward to late October, and I manage to get out there after a very busy work schedule roofing sucks. Go to school kids for a weekend. So Friday, I take my bait out to one of my stands, the closest one to the cabin. I get there and notice there isn't much deer sign, so I decide to lug my bag out three miles down until the swamp where I find my next stand with heavy sign. So I spread my pile out. I put my steps in so I can climb it in the morning and begin to head back. The third stand, the furthest one out, was only a mile away from the one I was at situated on the side of a fairly large hill. I get within a quarter mile of it on my GPS, when suddenly I begin to pick up on a bad feeling. Like my body was telling me something was up. Normally I know better than Ty go against this, but this is as remote as you can get from Michigan, so I carried on. The closer I got, the worse the feeling got. I got within 50 yards when I just froze. Something was wrong. The tree my stand was in was empty. There was no stand. But just to my right in front, about 30 feet from the tree, was my stand, mangled and broken. I ran over to it and started investigating. In front of the stand, five feet away on the ground, was a massive and fresh impact mark on the ground where it had hit, then bounced against a tree. Hard enough to leave a mark, again fresh, on the tree and cleanly snap the seat off. I then turned to me tree. I looked for marks and found none. Just the old marks from where I screwed my steps in a month and a half ago when I set it up. No footprints, nothing around the tree. Someone or something. Unstrapped my stand and threw it from 25 feet up the tree and traveled through the air, the same distance to the ground. This stand was not light either, easily 60 pounds. I knew I needed to get out of there quick, so I booked it straight to the cabin. Stupid me went out to hunt the next morning in the stand with bait. I hunted from sunup to sundown, not seeing a damn thing. So around dark I started to pack up. Where I was facing, I could see the hill where I had the other stand, and just as I was about to get down I could see a light. Then two, then four or five lights. They were moving erratically around the general area of the stand. It was so silent I could barely hear some faint voices. I noped out of there silently and in the dark. The next day I was done. I had decided to pick up my remaining stands and leave. I went to the stand I hunted in the next day, when I seen the stand hanging in the tree next to the one I was in off a branch. I didn't investigate. I turned around and ran back to the truck. I was done. Nope, that was that. Called my boss and told him what was up. His theory was meth heads or marijuana growers. As for me, I have no clue. Anyway, today in the car on the way to the store, I was looking at the sky. It was about seven or eight at night, and I saw this strange thing in the sky. It had huge wings like a bat. It was like a dark brown color. There were no feathers at all. The body was black, with short or no hair. It had a very slim body and a small tail. The thing about this bat creature was its size. It was bigger than a hawk. And in my town, we always see hawks, so I'm used to seeing them. I'm also used to seeing bats. This creature flapped its wings slowly, but the bats here usually flap their wings fast. That's the strange part for me. I could have sworn it was pterodactyl. No one believes me. I just need to know what the hell I saw. Please help. It was a quiet night in suburban Maryland, and I was settling in for a relaxing evening at home after a long day at work. As I lounged on the couch, flipping through channels, I suddenly heard the sound of glass shattering in the kitchen. My heart raced as I realized someone was breaking into my home. Before I could react, I felt a sharp pain in my neck and my vision blurred. I struggled to stay conscious, but my body betrayed me, and I slipped into darkness. When I awoke, I found myself lying on a cold, metallic surface in a dimly lit room. Panic surged through me as I realized I wasn't in my home anymore. I struggled to sit up, my head spinning, and that's when I saw him Navy SEAL Tom. 
Tom was a tall, imposing figure with a chiseled jaw and piercing blue eyes. He was bound to a similar metallic surface, and despite his restraints, he appeared calm and collected. As our eyes met, he spoke in a hushed tone, Hey, stay calm. We've been abducted, but I have a plan to get us out of here. I tried to process his words as I looked around the room, seeing other terrified people restrained just like us. The thought of being abducted by aliens was horrifying, but Tom's presence and his confidence gave me a glimmer of hope. As we whispered to each other, Tom explained that he had been tracking these extraterrestrial beings for some time. They had been abducting humans for unknown reasons, and he had finally managed to get close enough to be taken with the hope of gathering intel and possibly putting an end to their nefarious activities. Tom revealed that he had a small, concealed blade hidden in his boot. With immense effort, he managed to free one of his hands and retrieve the blade. He swiftly cut through his restraints and moved to free me and the others in the room. As we worked together to free the remaining captives, Tom instructed us to stay low and quiet, ready to follow his lead. He stealthily opened the door to the room and peered down the dimly lit corridor. The walls were lined with strange, glowing symbols that seemed to pulsate with a life of their own. We followed Tom through the alien ship, our hearts pounding in our chests. The vessel was a labyrinth of twisting corridors and eerie chambers, but Tom navigated it with incredible skill. Eventually, we reached what appeared to be the ship's control room. Tom wasted no time in scanning the alien technology, quickly deciphering their language and controls. He discovered that the ship was programmed to return to Earth, and he set it on an immediate course back to our planet. As the ship hummed to life, Tom led us to the escape pods, explaining that it was too risky to remain on the vessel during re-entry. We all climbed into the pods, our hearts racing, and braced ourselves for the wild ride back to Earth. The escape pods jettisoned from the alien ship, hurtling through the atmosphere at breakneck speed. As we touched down, we were greeted by a team of military personnel who had been tracking the alien ship. They helped us from the pods, and we were quickly whisked away to a secure location for debriefing. I couldn't believe what had just happened. The nightmare of being abducted by aliens was over, and I owed my life to Navy SEAL Tom. He had risked everything to infiltrate the alien ship and save us, and I knew I would be forever grateful. In the aftermath, Tom continued his work, hunting down any remaining extraterrestrial threats. As for me, I returned to my quiet suburban life, forever changed by the experience. The sweltering heat of the Mexican desert bore down upon us as our special forces unit moved stealthily through the arid landscape. We were hunters stalking the most dangerous prey imaginable cartel leaders. This was the heart of Mexico, a place where shadows concealed secrets darker than the night. I had been part of this elite team for years, seasoned by countless operations against the relentless drug lords who terrorized this country. Our latest target, Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, the elusive kingpin who had managed to evade capture for so long. The cartel's reach was vast, its influence undeniable, but we were unrelenting in our pursuit. Our coalition consisted of Mexican Special Forces and the U.S. D. united by a common goal, to dismantle the cartel's empire and bring El Chapo to justice. We had chased leads, tracked down informants, and followed every thread of intelligence that promised to lead us closer to our quarry. The desert stretched endlessly before us as we closed in on one of El Chapo's rumored hideouts. The intel was sketchy, as always, but this was our best lead yet. We moved with utmost caution, every step calculated to avoid tipping off our prey. As we approached the location, my heart pounded with a mix of anticipation and dread. The stories about El Chapo's ruthlessness were notorious, but I knew we couldn't afford to falter. Lives depended on our success, and the weight of that responsibility hung heavy on my shoulders. Our unit moved in, each member like a well-oiled machine, silent and precise. But as we entered the hideout, something caught my eye, something inexplicable amidst the chaos of the drug trade. In the dim light, I saw it an entity so bizarre, 
It defied all rational explanation. The creature stood on two legs, much like a man, but its appearance was far from human. It was covered in coarse, jet black fur, which seemed out of place for the time of year. Its eyes were wide and glowing, pulsating with an eerie white light. My gaze was drawn to its long arms, not quite as extended as an ape's, but hanging close to its chest. Its hands had only three fingers, resembling claw-like appendages more than anything else. I tried to contain my shock and whispered a warning to my comrades. But as soon as the creature sensed our presence, it moved with an unnatural swiftness, darting into the shadows of the hideout. Panic rippled through our ranks as we fumbled to locate the intruder, our training momentarily forgotten. When I finally managed to tell my colleagues about the creature, they scoffed and exchanged incredulous glances. They accused me of being high or sleep-deprived, dismissing my account as the product of a stressed mind. The mission took precedence, and they insisted that we focus on our primary objective, capturing El Chapo. Though I pushed aside the bizarre encounter for the time being, I couldn't help but feel a nagging unease. It wasn't until later, when I had a moment to reflect, that I realized how eerily real the creature had been. The memory of its pulsating white eyes haunted my thoughts, like a phantom lurking in the corners of my mind. Our pursuit of El Chapo continued relentlessly, culminating in a dramatic operation that led to his capture. The victory was bittersweet, for the shadows of Mexico held more mysteries than we could comprehend. Years later, as I recounted my story to those who had never ventured into the depths of the cartel's world, they too dismissed it as a figment of my imagination. But I knew the truth, that in the heart of darkness, where reality and myth converged, our mission had brought us face to face with the inexplicable, a creature that defied the boundaries of reason and existence. I didn't personally hear the noise. It was my father who shared this story with me upon returning from an early morning hunting trip. He admitted that he couldn't identify the source of the sound, leaving open the possibility that it could have been a Bigfoot. However, he chose not to report it, considering it too absurd. Based on his account, though, I'm inclined to believe that it was indeed a Sasquatch. The incident occurred during the early hours of the morning, before the sun had even risen. Positioned on a ridge, my father patiently awaited the first light of day, hoping to spot any deer in the vicinity. As the sun gradually made its appearance, the chorus of birdsong filled the air. But as soon as the sun crested over the eastern mountain, a distinct sound reached his ears. Instantly, the avian symphony fell silent, as if abruptly muted. In that hushed moment, my father discerned the unmistakable sound of an animal crashing through the creek below. A peculiar sensation washed over him, causing the hairs on the back of his neck to stand on end. Instinctively, he felt a strange foreboding and promptly decided to leave the area. In recounting the noise, my father likened it to the echoing reverberation of metal meeting metal within a vast chamber. The sound seemed to originate from a considerable distance, possibly from the next mountain over, although he couldn't determine the precise direction. While I wasn't personally present to witness these events, the sincerity in my father's voice and the eerie details he shared leave little doubt in my mind that something truly extraordinary occurred that morning a fleeting encounter with the mysterious Sasquatch. I'm in the Marine Corps, not spooky in a supernatural way, but in a I can't believe they're just going to let this slide way. One of the guys in my old unit was a quiet, keep-to-himself kind of guy. Nice person, but of course he got messed with. After a while, he had enough of it and explained to one of my friends that he had a stabbing list, and you're the first one on it. He reports the incident. They file paperwork to process him out of the Marine Corps. After six months, they just let it go. So there's a guy still on active duty with a clear mental issue and I'm just kind of waiting to see him snap. Edit. I've never personally F with any of my Marines from the time I joined until now, as I said, this was a friend doing this. I remember what it was like having some asshole mess with me when I was a boot just for that reason. I pride myself on treating everyone I came in contact with with respect. 
I've seen how people think by picking up rank, they're no longer required to work and automatically think they're special. I've made it a point to work side by side my Marines instead of kicking back and supervising. I've stood up for myself and others numerous times when our worthless chain of command try to push everyone, assuming they'll just take it and never speak for themselves knowing damn well their actions aren't justified. As I've said, many military members will always F with the new guy. I don't necessarily agree with it because the only thing accomplished by that is having co-workers who have no respect for you. I can't control what others do, but I guarantee any of the Marines that worked with me will tell you good things because I worked right by their side and had them call me by name and not rank. Since I don't think most military norms actually work, About a decade ago, I went looking for deer sheds in a new place here in Northeast Oregon. I had a pretty good day and picked up a few buck horns. As a chronic sufferer from nextrogitis, I was still a few miles from my truck as it was getting dark. I had stupidly left my headlight in the truck, so I knew it was going to be a long evening fumbling in the snow and deadfall timber. Right at dark, I heard a wolf howl in the bottom of the canyon, maybe three-quarter mile directly downhill big country. I thought to myself, well, that's pretty cool, then heard another respond a few hundred yards closer. I was really enjoying the experience until another responded 100 yard behind me in the pitch black timber with a much deeper, gut-wrenching howl. After a moment of silence, the surrounding area ignited with howls in every which direction. No longer really enjoying the experience, I unstrapped a 4PT shed to protect myself and began the trek towards my truck, which was right in line with the source of the deep, commanding howl. So off I go in the pitch black timber, in a remote area I had never been before, with nothing but a 60FT shed to protect myself. Meanwhile, the wolves were communicating back and forth until the Alpha would howl and shut them up momentarily with the eeriest howl you can imagine. This continues as I make my way through the woods, however every time the Alpha would howl it was still 100 yards behind me. After this happens a few times, I get a solid idea of what is taking place It's following me. All I can do is keep hiking. After a while, I make it back to a trail and scoot pretty quickly back to my truck. Upon reviewing Google Earth later that night and identifying landmarks, I determined that the wolf stayed right behind me for two half miles as I fumbled my way in a V-shaped line back to my truck. The next day and subsequent weekends, I went back properly armed and counted at least ten wolves in that pack, and was able to identify the alpha based on his howl, a big old grey colored one. I've had cats creep up on me at night, had my share of supernatural experiences none backcountry related, thankfully. But nothing will make a guy feel more vulnerable than walking through the pitch black woods, without a headlight, without a sidearm, not really knowing where he's going pre on X or GPS for me, and being followed by the alpha wolf. Needless to say, I now always carry a headlight, batteries, and some form of protection on me at all times. I go camping now and then, and there's really nice lake out in the woods about 3-4 hours walk east of Oslo, Norway. It's a popularish camping spot, so a friend and I are running out of firewood and it's pitch black. Bad planning plus whiskey drunk so we grab our flashlights and head out to get some more bits and pieces to keep the fire going. Now the lake is large and dotted around the lake we can see about 3-4 fires going. Other happy campers. One campsite in particular is rowdy. It's a good 200 meters across the lake, but we can hear them chanting and singing football songs and generally be obnoxious. It's about 2 a.m. now and we want to sleep. I can do this weird thing with my voice. I let all the air out of my lungs and then breathe in really fast and tighten my voice box. I can create this ungodly banshee and human scream that is loud and does not sound human. So I go for it. Within a second, the noise from other campsites stop and the fires are doused within 10 seconds. You could hear a pin drop all across the lake. Silence. Sheer terrified silence. Even my campmate was freaked out he'd never heard me do it before.
I'm from Victoria, Australia, and an avid hiker and camper. I feel most at home in the bush and in the mountains with my boys practicing bushcraft and survival. It's the best form of therapy. I have a deep respect for nature and believe we are not being told and taught what is really out there. My story goes back to the year 1998 when I was 18 at the time in Gippsland, Victoria. This was dairy country with beautiful rolling green hills. This night I and my friend had gone to the town of Mo to spend some time at a nightclub. The club closed around 2 a.m. so we decided to head back to my hometown of Yerrigan, which is only about a 25 minute drive. As we got on the Princess Freeway to head back to home the fog really set in. It was very thick. We had music playing and talking away about our night out, driving very slowly. Just before getting to the town of Trafalgar, there is the Trafalgar Cemetery, which is just outside of the town on the left side of the highway. As we came along the road and to a slight bend which was to the left, all of a sudden something jumped into the middle of the road. The hairs on the back of my neck are standing up. This thing was huge and I mean big. I've never seen anything like this in my life. We have no animals this big in Australia, so I've thought until this night. My friend Adam was driving. He slammed on his brakes. This creature was on all fours, but it wasn't. It was hard to describe. It just stopped and stared at us, and this thing is only 25 to 30 feet away from us, in the open and heavy fog. It was covered in hair, longer on the forearms and the legs, gray to black, silvery in the headlights. The eyes were glowing red and big. The hands, feet, and arms were massive and very long, thick, and muscular. It just sat there in a squat position. The head and face resembled a wolf, but the snout was shorter and more pushed in. The height of this thing to its head had to be at least five to six feet off the ground, and this thing is squatting, so try to picture this thing if it stood up. The shoulders had to have been three to four feet wide. It felt like a good minute of looking at each other, but it was probably closer to 10 to 15 seconds. My face was up against the windshield trying to figure out what I'm looking at. My friend Adam burst into tears instantly from fear. Being cold outside, you can see this thing taking massive inhales and exhales and the chest moving in and out. It moved in a way like it didn't know whether to attack or flee. It was terrifying to look at. Then, all of a sudden, its body shifted to its left, and the amount of power it generated to leap itself off was the most impressive thing I have ever seen. For such a massive animal to spring itself off and bang it was gone in one bound. This is on a three-lane highway. It was in the middle. It cleared the road in one leap. I don't know how long, but it felt like a long time in silence without him crying. A part of me didn't want it to leave. This hasn't stopped me from going into the wild remote bush solo. Well, about three years ago, I went out with a friend on his yacht off the coast of Newfoundland. It was around maybe two or three in the morning and early fall, so there was a bit of fog, nothing too serious. We were just going out for a late night cruise to relax and see if we could find any cool fish inverts, etc. near the surface. After an hour or so of uneventful yachting, we decided to call it a night and turn around. As we started heading back to shore, behind us we noticed a dim red light in the distant fog. We slowed down to watch it. It was slowly blinking, which stopped us from noticing that it was creeping towards us. We went inside to grab my friend's camera, and when we came back it's seriously closer and moving quicker too. We could now hear the hall groaning as if it was under pretty heavy tension. We took a picture with flash and the light stopped blinking. The ship started to speed up so my friend got on the radio, not too familiar with how the system works. So fill in the blanks here experts and started trying to find a wavelength they were on so he could tell them to slow down and go around us. When we came out of the cabin, it was basically right upon us. Like less than 10 feet away, this huge rusty ship with a red light on the nose. Next thing we know, it's hours later and we're waking up to sunrise. The yacht had been drifting freely for hours with the engines still off. Our cameras were gone, as was my cell phone my friends was a shitty cameraless phone. We reported it to the police, 
but they laughed us off as two young guys who got too drunk and couldn't handle ourselves out there. We were drinking though, so we know something happened. I lived alone in an old house and had a creepy stay. Again, the house was old, a huge house built in 1915 and converted into apartments for World War I soldiers before they went overseas. I rented one apartment about 1,000 square feet by itself, and the rest of the house was empty rooms and a giant staircase. As soon as I moved in, I met the next door neighbor, Rebecca, who about 30 seconds into the conversation asked me if I knew the house was haunted. I laughed it off, but she insisted it wasn't safe wasn't worried, moved in, cleaned out a lot of junk and fixed the place up as well as I could. Over the next few months, Rebecca and I ran into each other here and there, and each time she added to the story. Apparently, there was an old lady who lived in the apartment before me who never left, never opened the windows and never cleaned. She died in the apartment and there was an estate sale to get rid of some of her stuff. Rebecca told me during the estate sale she had gone into the basement and regretted it. About a week later, I decided to go check out the basement, I think partly to prove to myself I wasn't concerned. I was also curious. I'm not superstitious and I don't believe in ghosts, but the occult is interesting to me. As soon as I stepped in the basement, I was creeped out. It smelled musty, but not like I have ever smelled before. Along the steps, there were burned down candles that made bluish gray wax puddles. The basement itself had two huge water heater tanks also covered in wax and an empty concrete floor behind the tanks that had nasty looking towels around and more candles. Bizarre, but not haunted. At this point, I've lived in the apartment by myself for about three months without any problem. My car got broken into one night, but that wasn't surprising given the neighborhood. Nothing strange had happened until the night I checked the basement. At 4 a.m. I bolted awake because I heard something in my room. This was odd for me because I sleep like a dead man. Sat in bed for a minute, heard nothing and went back to sleep. Around 6 a.m. I had a night terror. Heard the noise again and woke up, but this time had sleep paralysis. I saw a black figure walk in my room and stop just inside the doorway. At this point, I think it's a robber, and I start trying to ask what he wants, but I can't speak or move. Nothing like this had ever happened to me before, and I was terrified. After the longest two, three minutes of my life, I willed myself out of sleep, and the whole atmosphere changed. No one was there. Nothing was out of place. No locks were broken. Nothing. I quickly got ready and showed up at work two hours before it opened. Over the next few weeks, I would hear the sound again here and there. It was a scratching and thumping sound, always very early in the morning. As soon as I would wake up, it would stop. Then one morning, it was especially loud. Still dark outside, 5 a.m., I heard it just behind the headboard of my bed. This time, I made sure I was totally awake. I laid perfectly still and didn't even breathe, and I heard it again, now fully awake. There was definitely something in my room. After the sleep paralysis imaginary robber episode, I had bought a kid's baseball bat and set it next to my bed for self-defense, can't afford a gun. I picked up the bat and slid out of bed. Every minute or so, I would hear the rusting, scratching, thumping noise. It was in my closet. I stood outside the door and my heart was pounding at this point. All the stories of the place being haunted, the creepy basement, the sleep paralysis episode, the weird early morning noises, all of it had built up in my mind and led to this moment. I was about to do battle with some evil force. I threw the door open and swung into the darkness, hitting nothing. I beat my clothes like a madman, but there was nothing in there. Then I heard a little scurry on the floor and saw something jump into one of my shoes. Upon closer inspection, it was a baby squirrel. I went outside later and found a hole in the roof. There was a family of squirrels living in my ceiling that was very active in the early morning, and one of the babies had somehow managed to find its way into my closet to scare the hell out of me. Not haunted, just squirrels. This happened around three years ago, and thinking about it still makes me feel uneasy. 
I live in a rural area surrounded by a nature conservation area. There are many nice paths, and it's a great peaceful and quiet place to go for walks, ride bikes. On this day, I decided to take my dog for a walk there in the evening. I didn't want to go that far. For some reason, I decided to leave my phone at home, even though I usually take it with me, just in case. Everything was going well, and as usual, I barely met anyone. At some point, I got to my favorite spot, a wooded area. There is a field behind it, and I planned on walking all the way to the end. Then I wanted to turn around and take the same way home. As I continued walking after I made it through the wooded area, my dog started acting strange. She kept looking back and didn't want to go on. I thought she had spotted a deer or a rabbit and wasn't concerned. I didn't look around right away, but then she let out a little growl bark. I had never heard her do that before. I turn around and sure enough, there is a man standing on the edge of the wooded area field like maybe 10 meters next to the path. He was fully clothed and didn't move. He was just staring at us. My heart was pounding. No matter where I would go, I would still be in a secluded area for a while. I didn't think and just started walking quickly towards the end of the field. My dog still wasn't having it. When I turned around after getting a bit further away, he had also moved. Now he was standing on the field, still staring intensely. That's when I really knew we had to get going. I didn't look back until we got to the end of the field. Because of some trees, my view was obstructed. I couldn't see him and my dog seemed a bit calmer. Obviously, I didn't want to stop for more than a few seconds, though. From there on, I decided to take the, the path that would take me to some part of my town the quickest. We literally ran, and I was so relieved when we made it back to civilization. I have no idea what his intention was. I'm just proud of my dog for alerting me. I work as a security guard on the graveyard shift. I think most guards have all gotten the heebie-jeebies a few times on this shift. I used to work at a large semi-well-known meat processing plant. I remember it was about 2 a.m. and I was making my inside rounds, and I was walking down the third floor hallway. The third floor is basically just a bunch of electrical access panels and storage rooms. There are a few offices up there, but for the most part, there's nothing special up there. So I'm going along checking that doorknobs are locked, etc. Making sure nothing looks broken, etc. Then my phone chimes. I'm like, who the F is messaging me this late? I pull out my phone and there's no message. I chalk it off as a notification for an app, but I don't see any notifications. Well, whatever, no big deal. Then about two minutes later, my radio turns on and I hear static. Now this spooks me. No one else has access to radio at this point. I'm the only living human on the entire property, and all the other radios are under lock and key inside my guard shack, also under lock and key. We were a radio for formality mostly. I can switch it to a different channel to talk with the one maintenance guy who's there, but he's not working this night, so it's like, hum, that's a little weird. I switch to that channel and I say, security to M4, are you there? M4 equals maintenance employee 4. There's three different guys that do it on a rotating schedule, but no reply. I hear the radio turn on again. This time it sounds like somebody is fumbling with the mic, but I can't hear any words. At this point I'm like, well F, guess I should go check it out. I make my way to the maintenance office. It's in the basement, the one place I don't like to go, because for one I always get weird feelings going down the stairs, and two, the entire basement is just a bunch of access tunnels and generators. It's pretty much a maze just beckoning to get you to be lost in. So I go down there, the whole time my radio is randomly turning on and shit. I get to the office, and as expected it's locked, lights are off, etc. I breathe a sigh of relief and turn to go, thinking ill just write this down on the daily report as malfunctioning equipment. But as I start to almost walk around the turn in the hallway, I hear the sound of the maintenance door unlocking. I stop dead in my tracks and turn around. My heart is kind of beating harder at this point. I reach for my tase gun and ready it, aiming it out before me, 
while I go back to the office. Lights are still off. Can't see a damn thing in there. For a food five minutes, I stand at the door questioning if this is worth it. Do I make enough for this kind of BS? What if there's a criminal in there? How would that even be possible? Did someone sneak up on me? Am I going to die in a minute? I finally said F it and pushed the door open and reached in and flipped on the lights. Nothing. No one is in there. I look under the desk. Constantly on edge. I see nothing. I look at the desk surface, see if there's any notes, etc., but nothing. I start to sigh of relief, and then the lights suddenly turn off and the door locks itself. I freak the F out and switch on my mag light and swing around. As I'm swinging around, I see a shadow move away from the light. My eyes see it and mentally I freak the F out, but I force myself to ignore it while I fumble to get my keys out to unlock the door. To do so, I have to turn the flashlight off so I have both hands. The whole time I have my back turned to the door, I feel like I'm being watched by something sinister. I eventually get the door unlocked and step out into the hallway. I turn around, flip the lights on, see nothing, turn them off, shut the door and lock it. I look at my watch. It's like 2.30 a.m. ish. I lean up against the hallway wall, breathing heavily. My mind replaying everything in my head trying to figure out what the F just happened. I eventually give up and hurriedly make my way back to the first floor. I get back to the first floor and at this point I have no desire to go back to the third floor. I can do it some other time. So I eventually make it to the exit and just before I walk out the door to go outside to my guard shack, the radio turns on and there's some static and I faintly hear someone laugh. Just a short like ha ha and then it's dead. I yank my radio out of my pocket clip and look at it. I go to turn on the mic to say like F you or something, but my radio is totally utterly dead. I live in North Texas near a large wildlife refuge and a lake bigger than my hometown. One night I had a fantastic idea to go down the long gravel road to the dock with a female friend of mine. I'm from Texas, so I usually carry, but opted to leave my gun locked in the glove box by the gate. About 30 yards into the trek, the road was about 200 yards to the dock, I hear an unnerving noise on my left. It was as if the earth itself growled and rumbled at me. I looked around frantically, trying to pinpoint the sound. Nothing. We stood still, waiting for it to resume. Instead, we hear just heavy footsteps, not crashing or rustling like a bear or a pig does, but heavy pacing. I turned to my friend and asked if she wants to go back. She didn't know, but wanted to get out of there. So we keep on our journey to the dock with the unnatural growling, rumbling following us, coupled with the heavy paces. I'm terrified by this point, instinctively reaching for my right hip to find a blank space where a holster should be. I had left my pistol locked in the glove box, I grab my pocket knife and palm it aggressively. The rumbling continues, almost impacting the air with its weight. We hasten our pace and it matches ours, but never coming out of the woods to show itself. This continues for about 300 yards. The entire time I am absolutely terrified. I've been hunting and camping since I was six, and I've never heard a sound like this one, or even had an experience similar. Finally arriving to the dock, she sprints out to the edge, and I grab a handful of rocks and go sit beside her. For the next 15 minutes, it circles the area around the dock landing, emanating the rumbles and growls. Nothing we can do, it's dark, I have no firearm, and we can't see it. I call my buddy Dennis, who lives five minutes away. The rumbling and pacing continues, roughly 30 to 40 yards away from us, but it doesn't step foot on the dock. Finally, I see headlights come up over the trees and the rumbling fades into darkness. Dennis comes walking down, cradling a rifle, and that was the end of that. Really freaked me out for a couple of months. I'm a believer in cryptozoology now. I don't know if Bigfoot exists, but something does that may be similar, especially considering most cultures have their monster.
It was a cold evening in January 2023 in Navajo Summit, Arizona. I had my two nieces with me, one was six, the other eight. I had gone to our family cabin, waiting on my sister to return from town. The evening started at about 7 p.m., and we didn't have a key to the house. We waited for a couple hours, and the girls eventually fell asleep in my truck. As the night continued, the temperature also dropped. I fell asleep as well. I woke around 9.30 p.m. It was very cold in the truck. I started the vehicle. As I depressed the brake pedal to start the truck, I noticed in the side mirror a face looking at me from the glow in the tail light. I hesitated to look at first, but gathered enough courage to observe it again. I saw a white face with long gray-white hair and black eyes looking at me. I freaked out. Once I started the truck, I sped off and headed to the highway, not sure if what I saw was following us. It was. I continued down the highway in a panic. After a few minutes, I felt as if something had jumped into the bed of my truck. I turned west ahead towards a town called Ganado. I went as fast as I could to my parents' house. Upon reaching the turnoff, I felt it jump out of the truck and watched the same white-haired entity run along the right-of-way fence. As I pulled up to the house, I quickly carried my nieces inside. Once inside, I situated the girls for bed. Later that night, I dreamed that I walked about two miles to my aunt's house. No one was home. As I walked back home, I noticed this same white-haired thing paralleling me. I quickly ran home went inside and locked the door behind me, and then went to bed. As I woke the next morning, I noticed sand and dirt at the foot of my bed. I told my parents of what had happened and of what I had dreamed. Since we are native Navajo, they took me to a medicine man, and he told me that I actually sleepwalked to my aunt's house, and when I entered the house, it followed me in. Totally freaked me out. Did I encounter a skinwalker? The medicine man refused to answer my questions, but my father is still vigilant and believed that I was the target of a native witch. So I grew up in a small town in Canada. Just up from my house in the hillside, there was a shack. This shack was a bit bigger than an outhouse had a bed and a desk in it. Every full moon at about 2 a.m. you could see this figure standing overlooking my neighborhood followed by a dark ominous laugher and cries if this thing has been hurt deeply. What's strange is only the kids in the neighborhood could see it. It doesn't stop there though. We were all sitting in the hot tub at my neighbor's house and the house next to his was just getting built. So there was no fence between his house and the new house. We were all talking when my buddy saw something in the basement window he was facing the house. We all turn and at the same time we see an old man in the window and his smile grew to a huge size. We all saw it. Since then nothing has happened because we all moved and went separate ways. But now the hillside has been fully developed into housing. Do you think this was an evil entity or some soul suffering? When I was 11 years old, my father decided to treat us to a sledding adventure on a logging road not too far from our home. The location boasted higher elevation, guaranteeing better snow for our winter escapade. We gathered our excitement and set off to a place known as the Five Mile Cause, named after the steep hill it featured. As we arrived at our destination, I couldn't contain my enthusiasm. The left side of the hill was adorned with towering timber while the right side revealed a vast clear cut. At the bottom of the hill, a road emerged, stretching into the open expanse. My father, the ever-prepared adventurer, had even built a fire at the top of the hill to keep us warm as we indulged in the thrill of sledding. Eager to experience the rush, I decided to embark on a solo run down the hill. With adrenaline coursing through my veins, I slid down the slope, feeling the wind whip past me. Finally, I reached the bottom and gracefully came to a stop. Excitedly, I hopped off the sled and rose to my feet, ready to relish in the triumph of my speedy descent. But as I turned to my right, an unexpected sight froze me in my tracks. Two towering figures stood before me, their presence both mesmerizing and unsettling. These creatures, larger than any I had ever seen, locked their gaze upon me. 
In that moment, time seemed to stand still, and an inexplicable fear gripped my heart. Without a second thought, I pivoted on my heels and began walking away from the enigmatic beings. At first, my steps were cautious and deliberate, my eyes darting back to ensure I was not being pursued. But the growing sense of urgency urged me to quicken my pace. As my heart raced, I broke into a run, propelled by an instinctual need to distance myself from the unknown. About one o'clock in the morning, I stepped out on the front porch to put some dry food out for the cats, and evidently, I scared some type of creature because it was eating off the porch. And when I got out there and shut the door, it went down the bottom of the stairs to the driveway. It was small round. I didn't see any legs. I couldn't see its face. It didn't turn around. It had long brown hair that hung to the ground and it started to move. And it waddled as fast as it could, which wasn't very fast. It didn't have any legs and as it waddled, it kind of moved down the driveway. It started to grow, get taller and the brown hair was gone. It became short hair, dark hair. The legs grew as it went down the driveway. It wasn't making a sound. And I thought, as it's going down, I'm thinking raccoon. It gets to the end of the driveway and it's tall like a deer and I think deer. It runs across the street. It's not making a sound. It clears the sidewalk across the street with one foot. And at that point, I hear a hoof print. A hoof print. It ran across the lawn, the front lawn of the people up the street. They also have a concrete patio right after the lawn, and at that point, it made no noise as it went across the patio. At that point, I could see that it was growing long black hair, and it was running, and it was flowing up behind it. I watched it until it got all the way past all their lights. The street was well lit. I saw everything from the bottom of my porch to the end of the driveway. Hoof prints on the sidewalk cleared the lawn, no noise as it was going across their patio, and it started to grow long hair, black long hair that flowed out behind it. I don't know. I watched it until it went into the darkness. I had my porch light on. We have a street light out in front of the house. People across the street had their porch light on, which was unusual for one in the morning. We live in a cul-de-sac. The street is not very wide. At the end of the cul-de-sac, there's a field there, and there's a creek through their backyard and so it ran into the darkness. A couple of days later, I went over to the lady that lives in the cul-de-sac. I went in, sat down, and I told her all the things, and she sat there, stared out the window for a moment, and she said, well, I guess things happen. And she thought for another moment and said that she sees all kinds of animals coming up from the creek all the time. When I was 13 or 14, my mother's friend asked if I would like to babysit her kids for a few hours one night. I live in a rural town, and to get to their house, you have to drive to the outskirts of the town, about 15 minutes up a steep and narrow hill, surrounded by forest. Their house was just off the road. Now, if you pass their house, the road continues up into the mountains and forest, and eventually starts heading down the other side and onto a main road where you can turn right and head back to the town. This is a substantially longer route if you want to head back to town. Also pitch black as you're driving through woods. I was so exited and felt grown up to babysit. Mum's friend was lovely and her husband was a police officer. My dad dropped me off and Mum's friend was going to give me a lift home. I was there for a few hours, 11 p.m. or so, and all went well. When they returned, the mother said her husband police officer was going to drive me home. As we started off, he didn't turn right. Back down the road. The way we had come, he turned left, heading up the mountain and into the forest. I asked him, why are we going this way? He replied, it's just another way. Those were the only words he spoke to me. We sat in silence. He drove slowly deeper into the forest. When I said it was a longer route, I mean 45 minute drive instead of 15. I thought it was weird, but I was a naive and innocent kid. At one point I asked him if we were nearly there yet. No answer. 
I remember thinking maybe they had an argument as they were pretty cold with each other. When they got home, he did drop me off home safe and sound, and I thought nothing of it. Until I was an adult and the memory popped into my head one day. I don't understand why a grown man and a police officer would take that route with a young teen at 11.30 at night. I often wonder if he had sinister reasons. I didn't babysit again. Maybe I knew deep down it was weird. I never imagined that a secret meeting among government generals would thrust me into a living nightmare. I sat in a dimly lit, windowless room, surrounded by stern-faced men in uniform. Our top general, a man of steely resolve, paced before us, his voice commanding attention. Gentlemen, he began, we have captured one of the unknown creatures, but it has fled our laboratory. We must find it before it wreaks havoc. The hushed tension in the room was palpable as he continued to describe the creature we had inadvertently unleashed upon the world. Its description sent shivers down my spine. It had black fur that was very coarse looking, even for this time of year, the general explained. It was kind of like fur on a bear, but it stood up on two legs just like you and I do. The face was very wide, with eyes that were kind of glowing and pulsating white. It had very long arms, not quite as long as an ape's, but they hung right by its chest, and the hands only had three fingers, no thumbs that I could see. The fingers resembled more like claws. The room fell into an uneasy silence. The mere thought of such a creature roaming free in the world was a chilling prospect. The general's grim expression revealed the gravity of the situation. As the general continued to brief us on the urgency of the situation, I couldn't help but think of the innocent hikers and campers who frequented our national forests. They were oblivious to the lurking horror that had been unleashed upon them. Days turned into nights as we embarked on a relentless hunt for the escaped creature. Our search took us deep into the heart of the national forest where the creature had vanished. It was a place where the trees seemed to close in around us, casting eerie shadows in the moonlight. One fateful night, our pursuit took a sinister turn. We stumbled upon a grisly scene, the remains of an innocent hiker brutally mauled by the creature. Blood stained the forest floor, and our flashlights revealed a trail of destruction leading deeper into the wilderness. As we followed the gruesome path, the forest seemed to close in around us, and the atmosphere grew oppressive. Each rustle of leaves or snap of twigs sent shivers down our spines. We were no longer the hunters, we had become the hunted. Hours turned into days, and the relentless pursuit pushed us to the brink of exhaustion. Just when hope seemed lost, a stroke of luck led us to the creature's hiding place. A GPS signal provided the breakthrough we needed, and we closed in on its location. The final confrontation was a harrowing ordeal. The creature, cornered and desperate, unleashed its fury upon us. But we were prepared, armed with advanced technology and military precision. In the end, we captured the creature once more, ending the reign of terror it had unleashed upon the national forest. The death of the innocent hiker remained a secret, buried beneath layers of government cover-up. As I look back on that dreadful chapter of my life, I can't help but wonder how many more creatures like the one we captured might still be lurking in the shadows, waiting for their chance to escape. The horrors of that secret meeting continue to haunt my nightmares, a chilling reminder that the unknown can be far more terrifying than we ever dared to imagine. I'm not the type to believe in the supernatural, the occult, or even cryptids for that matter. But there's this one experience, an eerie encounter on the eve of Halloween that shook me to my core. I was young and invincible then, or so I believed, cruising down the rural roads of Illinois in my sleek sports car. It was a pitch black night, the kind that makes you feel like you're the only person left in the world, and I was relishing the solitude. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a black cat darted across the road. Its eyes, reflecting in my headlights, gave me just enough time to swerve, narrowly avoiding hitting it. The car spun out of control, the tires screeching against the asphalt, and came to a stop with the headlights facing a nearby field. 
and that's when I saw them. Dozens of people, all donned in black robes, standing amidst the tall grass. Their eyes, wide with surprise, reflected in my high beams. The sight was so surreal, so out of place, it took me a moment to fully comprehend what I was seeing. Before I could react, they scattered. Like shadows fleeing from the light, they dissolved into the darkness. But a few, their faces hidden beneath their robes, started charging towards my car. Fear gripped me, adrenaline surging through my veins. I could hear my heart pounding in my ears, and without thinking, I slammed on the accelerator, peeling out of there as fast as I could. The sight of the robed figures, their forms shrinking in my rearview mirror, is something I'll never forget. Now, this was back in the late 90s, before the Harry Potter frenzy took over. So, it's safe to say it wasn't some fan gathering. I don't know what they were doing out there in the middle of nowhere, in the dead of night. But it felt like I had stumbled upon something I wasn't supposed to see. Now to the part that still gives me chills to this day. In the split second before I hit the gas, I saw something else in that field. At the edge of my high beams, there was a figure, far taller than any of the robed people, hunched over and covered in hair. It stood on two legs and its eyes, glowing in the darkness, met mine. I've heard tales of cryptids, stories told to scare kids or thrill seekers, but in that moment, I couldn't deny what I was seeing. It was something unknown, something out of place in the world as I knew it. I didn't stick around to find out what it was. I just drove, leaving the field, the robed people, and the cryptid far behind. Since I can remember, I've always had a deep love for nature, you could say it's my passion. That's why a job as a park ranger felt like a perfect fit. I remember one particular job at a nature park that operated from 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. Our shifts were always rotating one week, I'd be on the early shift, and the next, I'd be closing up for the night. One Friday evening, I found myself on the closing shift. I had led a brief tour for some visitors that day, but other than that, my day was relatively quiet. Since there wasn't much to do, I decided to start my evening walk through early. It was already getting dark, and I was making my way through the woods when I noticed a strange light flashing against the trees behind me. Curious, I went to check out the source of the light. But as I got closer, the light flashed again, this time from the direction I had just come from. I yelled out, telling whoever was messing with me to stop it. Then, the light flashed again from a completely different direction, too far for a single person to have moved in such a short time. I figured it must have been two people messing with me, maybe some co-workers, although we weren't particularly close and we didn't typically play such pranks. I yelled again, stating I wasn't in the mood for jokes and that whoever was responsible should leave. Realizing I had no control over this situation, I informed my supervisor that someone might still be in the park and that it wasn't my problem anymore. He told me he'd take over, so I left, got in my car, and began the ten-minute drive home. Suddenly my phone rang. It was an unknown number. I answered it, and a raspy voice on the other end told me I shouldn't have left them there alone, that I would regret it. I warned them never to call me again and hung up. When I returned to work the next day, I was informed that they'd found a dead dog at the spot where I had seen the flashing lights. The realization hit me like a cold wave. This was the work of a seriously disturbed individual, someone who would commit such a horrific act just to mess with me. My friend and I used to go ghost hunting when we were in middle school. It consisted of me asking questions directed towards spirits and ghosts. This is pre-smartphone days. We also brought a handheld voice recorder that was pretty expensive. It was his dad's who was into music and playing instruments. We brought the recorder because we knew it was more likely we would get an EVP than an interaction we were aware of. EVP electronic voice phenomenon is when you record a noise or voice of a spirit, paranormal entity on your device. When you play the recording, you hear the ip which you did not hear with your own ears because the frequency was too high. I have had several interactions, but I'll talk about two right now. 
the first I actually heard, and it was terrifying. It was an especially creepy night at the location we were at which we frequented for these interactions. So creepy as took us 15-20 minutes to walk 20 feet. Other nights we would freely walk around and not be creeped out because we didn't feel like there was another presence. Well, this night there was something there, and after I asked a question something in front of me, about 10 feet away swiftly glided towards me while gargling a low og, which got progressively louder and more aggressive as it came towards me. The noise came all the way right up to me before I could start to run away. It moved really fast, but I could see absolutely nothing in front of me. There was no body there. My friend and I bolted and ran all the way home. We listened to the recorder the next morning since we were too afraid to play it that night. And it was exactly like I describe it now. The other experience. This was an F. We were listening to a recording at his house that we had just recorded. On the recording I was casually talking to him about something when all of a sudden there is a blood-curdling female scream. On the recorder it was way louder than my voice and long and drawn out as if a woman had just been stabbed or seen some horrific shit. It was the most chilling scream I have ever heard, and I did not hear it at all when I was at that creepy location having the conversation with my friend. On the recording device when the scream happens I am mid-sentence and I do not pause or react. Neither of us do. I remember that night and we heard no scream. I've had some other experiences that are just as scary, seen an actual apparition, seen poltergeist, had my girlfriend physically hit and pushed on more than one occasion, and I've had some other evas. My story goes back to 1975. My girlfriend and I were driving back to Idaho where I was going to school. We were headed towards Yellowstone Park and the Montana East Gate in a little yellow Volkswagen. It was around midnight and it was kind of snowing and picture a two-lane road with tall trees and no moon or nothing, just our headlights and the snow is falling. All of a sudden there was this figure I saw walking right in the center of the road, walking the same direction as me. In other words, her back was to me. It was a woman. At first I noticed her and I told my girlfriend, do you see what I see? A girl walking out here at midnight. It's probably about 30 degrees out. The closer we got, the more detail I could make out. It was so. I was going to roll down my window and ask if she needed help. But we noticed that she was wearing very, very old, I guess 19th century garb, clothing. And she had hobnail boots. She had a long shawl and around her shoulders and in her hair, she had long brown hair, down probably a little bit below her shoulder blades. And the closer we got, we noticed something weird. Her hair was completely dry, not wet like you would expect for somebody out in snow. I was about to roll down my window and my girlfriend goes, don't even stop, don't even look, go. You know, that freaked me out because I was just about ready to slow down. She said, don't even look in the mirror. She has no face. I drove away. You can imagine. Here we are putting along in a little Volkswagen, and I just slowly moved over to the right to avoid hitting her. As I moved off and later got to the gate, the ranger said, sorry, the pass is closed tonight due to the snow. I asked, you mean we got to go back? He says, well, there's a little motel about a half a mile back. We were scared out of our wits. Anyway, we got to this motel and fortunately the guy still had a room available. And as soon as we got in the room, we just locked the door and put the chair in front of it. The rest of the night we couldn't sleep. Using a throwaway in the off chance someone I know sees this. To give some parameters, I'm a 20-year-old guy in Tennessee. I've always been into cryptids, supernatural oddities, and basically everything mysterious or unexpected. However, I haven't had the time lately to research too much on which cryptids are which. Basically, a couple years ago, I started seeing weird deer. I couldn't explain why they were odd, they just didn't seem right. One day, I ended up seeing a rather large buck that had that aura about him, and I shit you not, he looked dead at me and stood right up on his rear legs. Needless to say, I bolted before he could start walking towards me. 
It continued, I ended up catching a couple of these encounters on camera, one of a deer levitating and another of one standing and walking all on my trail cams. Other creepy things started happening like hearing mimic sounds and the voice of my brother coming from the woods when he was standing next to me. I thought it was just something weird on this spooky chunk of land I lived on. I moved about an hour away from there a few months back, and nothing too crazy has happened since. That was until tonight when me and my girlfriend were laying in bed. We didn't get to bed until about 2.30 a.m. and around 3.13 we heard a weird noise through the open window above our bed. It's the goddamn mimicking again. Something is out there making very obvious fake dog noises. I almost went out to check and see if they were okay before my groggy ass remembered all the dogs were obviously brought in for bed over an hour ago. I know it sounds crazy, but I'm pretty sure whatever this is has followed me before, and it followed me again, maybe. What cryptid or thing has these traits in the middle, upper Tennessee region? Any comments or help would be greatly appreciated. It's 4.30 now and I'm laying in bed reading random books online and Reddit threads trying to learn what this is and how to deal with it. I used to hunt to fit in with the family many years ago. Didn't care for it. Wasn't good at it. Went and did it anyways. One of my first kills was a fawn. It was awful. I didn't mean to shoot a fawn. There was a whole herd of whitetail scattered around a field that we stumbled upon. The bastard donor I was with wasn't into hunting properly, so we came upon them driving at dusk, and he demanded I hop out of the vehicle and shoot at them from the truck door. I shot at the first brown thing that came into my sights. He was standing half behind a hilltop, and I thought I'd shot at the doe. I was wrong, and let me tell you, there is nothing like watching an entire herd of whitetail scatter, except for one lone doe who stays behind, standing there and calling loudly for her baby. I'll never forget how horrible it was. She didn't leave when we started approaching the fawn either. I got the gut-wrenching experience of watching her baby try to get up and run to her, but be entirely unable to because her front end was mangled while she cried out for it more and more frantically. Eventually she ran when we got too close, but she didn't go far. She stayed at the tree line while the bastard donor fired round after round point blank into the fawn's neck, missing each time and putting the animal in more and more distress. He was breaking its back, he said. He didn't. Eventually, it just bled out. I don't know when the doe left. She was gone when the fawn died. I was never able to go out into the fields after that. I'd questioned the family's hunting abilities for years at that point. I'd had concerns about their practices before, but seeing firsthand how ruthless, dangerous, and cruel so-called experienced hunters could be and being thrown into the situation of being a danger myself left me terrified of being in the tree fields with someone like that ever again. I'm still a massive supporter of safe, legal hunting, and I completely understand the appeal of it as both a sport and a lifestyle a freezer full of meat saves a lot of money. I'm thrilled when friends score a big hunt. I love seeing records set. But I'm also a huge advocate against any sort of poaching, improper gun use, and immoral hunting. People need to be educated about what they're doing and how. They need to understand the gravity that is killing another living thing. Yes, hunting can be thrilling, beneficial, and a great experience. But it's not like hockey or soccer or any other sport. It's dangerous and deadly. It's grim and disgusting. You either do it right, or you don't do it at all. I don't care how much fun you're having. You're involved in an activity with a lot of responsibilities, and if you can't fulfill that, you have no right to kill another living being. Couple that with how many people have died out where I live due to completely preventable hunting accidents, because so many people are like the bastard donor and worse, and you couldn't pay me enough to go back out there again. Back in 1995, my ex and I were driving from Langlea, FB, Virginia to Columbus, Ohio. We were on 33 between Harrisonburg, Virginia and Elkins, West Virginia. Very Appalachia, if you know what I mean. 
To our right, just off the highway and in the forest, there was something very large and gray moving parallel to us. We only saw it for a moment as I was probably doing 80 miles per hour. We didn't get a good look at it because it was obscured by the trees and I was speeding. It looked like the side of an elephant, no head, just this big, gray body walking. I said to my ex-wife, did you see that? She replied, WTF was that? We were both shocked. We later joked it was Baby the Dinosaur because we were kids from the 80s. I've seen strange things before and since, but nothing tops that. I haven't thought about it in probably 10 years, but was talking to my wife and son this morning about weird things, and it came up. I googled West Virginia cryptids and found the Grafton monster. My memory is fuzzy, but this is close to what I saw. That's it. That's the tale. Just wanted to share. The allure of the forbidden always held a peculiar fascination for me. When I embarked on a solo hiking trip deep into the heart of the vast national forest, I couldn't resist the temptation to explore the uncharted territory that locals had long warned me about. This area, hidden from the prying eyes of tourists and authorities, was rumored to be cursed, a place where ancient legends whispered secrets of unspeakable horrors. As I ventured further from the well-trodden paths, the forest became denser and more foreboding. The gnarled branches of ancient trees seemed to claw at the sky, casting eerie shadows that danced like malevolent spirits. The oppressive silence pressed in around me, broken only by the occasional rustle of leaves or the distant hoot of an owl. The trees began to thin, revealing a desolate clearing in the heart of the forest. Here, the sunlight struggled to penetrate the canopy, casting a feeble glow that only served to enhance the eerie ambience. Amidst the tall, moss-covered rocks, I spotted an enormous boulder that beckoned me closer. It was beneath this colossal stone that I stumbled upon something that defied reason, a nightmarish tableau that would haunt my dreams for years to come. There, nestled beneath the rock's imposing shadow, lay the desiccated remains of a creature that could only be described as colossal. The partially buried corpse was massive, with elongated limbs that stretched outwards as if in defiance of death itself. The skeletal structure was unlike anything I had ever encountered, bearing no resemblance to the fauna of our modern world. The bones were aged and yellowed with time, hinting at an existence that spanned millennia. My heart pounded in my chest as I dared to get closer, my trembling hands reaching out to touch the ancient remains. But as I examined the creature more closely, an unthinkable terror gripped me with icy fingers the colossal carcass had moved. Panic seized my senses as the bones shifted and creaked, sinews and tendons that should have long turned to dust strained and flexed. The ancient giant, or whatever abomination it was, stirred beneath the weight of time. In that horrifying moment, the very laws of nature seemed to unravel. Without a second thought, I turned and fled my footsteps echoing through the chilling silence. The dense forest closed in around me like a suffocating shroud, and my heart pounded a desperate rhythm in my chest. Fear and disbelief warred within me as I pushed myself to run faster and farther. Finally, I burst out of the forbidding part of the forest, back into the relative safety of the more familiar trails. Gasping for breath, I collapsed onto a mossy knoll, my mind reeling with the magnitude of what I had witnessed. What had I stumbled upon in that forbidden clearing? Was it an ancient giant, a Nephilim, or something even more nightmarish? Questions swirled through my thoughts, and I couldn't help but wonder if the legends and whispers of the cursed forest held more truth than anyone could have ever imagined. What did I just witness, and what unspeakable horrors lay hidden beneath the ancient trees of the National Forest? In April 2011, a friend and I were stargazing on my roof on a dry, clear night in New Jersey. We were observing the Lyrids meteor shower that wasn't producing as many shooting stars as we had hoped, but we stayed up there, intensely focused on the sky to see one every few minutes. After a couple hours of this, we caught a bright light in our peripherals. We turn around and see what looks like a bright blue-white LED flashlight traveling in the forest behind the house. 
At first instinct, we thought it was the police with a flashlight chasing someone. But then we realized that the light was up in the treetops, weaving through the canopy. All we could say is, WTF, is that over and over again as it got closer to us. It was traveling along the direction of the river behind our house and seemed to notice us because as it passed the back of my house, it slowed to a gentle stop, then took a 90 degree turn onto the clearing of our property about 40 feet from us coming straight towards us, as if it had noticed us and wanted to check us out. This is when we got our first really good look at it. It was a perfectly defined glowing sphere of light, the size of a basketball with what seemed like churning flowing plasma inside. Icy blue white hue emitting absolutely no sound at all. We started screaming at this point. As it approached, it moved very slowly compared to the pace it had traveling through the trees. It seemed almost cautious in its movement. It's weird, but you could sense some form of intention intelligence in its movement. We were horrified because we knew nothing could explain what we were seeing, and we weren't about to F around and find out by letting it get any closer. We scrambled off the roof and ran inside, hiding under a blanket like scared little children, even though we were in our late teens. We didn't talk about it much after that because we just couldn't explain it. About a year later, one of my neighbors is banging on my door telling me to let him in. He told me that him and a friend were down by the river in that same patch of woods and were chased by a floating silent light ball. This freaked me out because I knew he was telling the truth. I had never told him the story of my encounter. I'm a trucker by the name of Jack. I've driven through many a desolate stretch of road, passing by endless miles of nothingness. The solitude doesn't bother me. In fact, I kind of like it. But there's this one memory, this one particular drive through the middle of nowhere Colorado that still sends a chill down my spine. There wasn't much around. Just barren landscapes, the open road stretching out in front of me, and my truck humming along to the rhythm of the highway. It was the only road visible on my map, and it was almost eerily devoid of human touch. But then, up ahead in the horizon, probably about a half mile away from the road, I spotted an unusual cluster of houses or buildings. In a place so desolate, so untouched by civilization, the sight of these structures seemed utterly out of place. Intrigued, I kept my eyes on them as I approached, curiosity piqued by the incongruity of it all. As I drove past, I got a clearer view. The houses were set up in a circle, forming a sort of perimeter around an open area. What was more unsettling, though, were the people I saw walking around in the center. They were all donned in black robes, their faces hidden from view, gathering in a tight circle. Then, out of nowhere, three black SUVs appeared. They drove across the barren landscape, plumes of dust rising in their wake heading directly towards the group. A sense of unease crept over me, a cold shiver snaking down my spine as I watched the scene unfold. Something about it felt wrong, like I was inadvertently witnessing something I shouldn't. I remember wishing I had the time to stick around, to see what was really going on. But duty called. I had a schedule to keep, deliveries to make. So I kept driving, leaving the strange sight behind me. In the rearview mirror, the sight of the robed figures and black SUVs slowly faded into the vast Colorado landscape. I often find myself mulling over that sight, wondering what was happening back there. It seemed like something out of a cult movie, a secret meeting in the middle of nowhere. But I guess I'll never know for sure. All I have is this unsettling memory and a story that sounds too strange to be true. I've seen many odd things during my years on the road. But that eerie sight in Colorado remains the most inexplicable of them all. There's something about driving at night that strips the world of its normalcy, turns the mundane into the mysterious. I learned this the hard way during a run from Yuma, Arizona, driving the lonely stretch where the I-8 intersects the 85 at Gila Bend. It was a familiar route for me. I'd made countless runs along that road, so much so that I even had a regular spot where I'd pull over to stretch my legs and take a leak. That night was no different, 
or at least that's what I thought as I rounded a bend, the spot in question just up ahead. As I was about to pull over, my headlights illuminated a figure strolling across the highway. It was a creature unlike anything I'd seen before, a strange amalgamation of features that didn't belong together. It looked canine, but its appearance was grotesquely warped. Its hind legs were elongated, almost rabbit-like, but twisted in a way that didn't seem natural. Its body was lean and muscular, its defined muscles rippling under the skin as it moved. Its snout was long and narrow like that of a wolf, but devoid of any fur. The creature's skin was an unusual sight, a stark contrast to the mangy patches you'd expect on a hairless animal. Instead, it was thick and tough-looking, almost akin to a rhino's, but it had an uncanny smoothness to it that caught the reflection of my headlights. But what really got me, what truly sent a shiver down my spine, was the way it regarded me. As I slowed down, it didn't panic or run away as you'd expect a wild animal to. It simply continued its leisurely stroll, its eyes never leaving me. It was as if it was sizing me up, unafraid and eerily calm. The creature was massive, easily the size of a Great Dane or a Cane Corso, and its bizarre, uncanny appearance left an indelible mark on my memory. I watched, paralyzed, as it disappeared into the darkness on the other side of the road. Needless to say, I didn't stop that night, nor any other night after that. My usual pit stop was permanently tainted by that eerie encounter. Now, every time I make that run, I can't help but scan the roadside, half expecting to see that creature again. And each time, a chill runs down my spine, a reminder of the night when the mundane turned into the mysterious. I have stories about both my farm and my boyfriend's farm that might be interesting to you. Farms have a lot of history. My family has been farming in the exact same spot since the 20 new 70 as when my family arrived from Germany, and his family has been farming in the same area since the 1930s. Therefore, they have lots of tales. My boyfriend's dad, I'll call him my father-in-law, because he basically, as I swear, has seen everything at least once and has the most interesting stories. I will share a couple of his to start. For context, my boyfriend's family farms on both sides of Iowa and Missouri border, since they live fairly close to the state line. They have corn, soybeans, and beef cattle on pasture. I particularly love the cattle, because I love getting to jump in the ranger and ride around the pasture with my boyfriend to check on the cows. We do this almost every night in the spring, summer, and fall to make sure they are healthy, not injured, account for the calves, make sure they have enough grass, and look to see if there are any holes or breaks in the fences. In the wintertime, they get moved to a lot with a covered shed to protect them from the elements, so they are not on the pasture, and we feed them hay. Anyway, in the mid-2000s, my father-in-law was out in the wooded area of the cattle pasture. The trees are quite dense here, and it often serves as a great deer hunting spot in the late fall winter once the cows have been moved to the winter lot. He was setting up trail cameras in the woods to watch deer in preparation for hunting season that fall. After some time, he came back out to get the card out of the camera to see if there were any big bucks roaming around. When he took a look at some of the pictures, he saw that there had been an unusual man back there. Trespassers aren't all that uncommon and often it's just an annoyance rather than cause for concern. There was no way to tell who it was, so he just forgot about it. A few days later, he went back to hang the camera back up in the tree. When my father-in-law went back a second time about a week later to get the camera to see the pictures, someone had dug three makeshift graves in the back corner of the pasture. At the head of each grave was a wooden cross with the first name on it. He unfortunately didn't catch the man on trail camera, but he alerted the police about the situation. I think based on the names on the crosses, the police had an idea of who it could have been. The rural Midwest is smaller than you think for being so vast. My father-in-law wasn't really sure what came of that and never asked too much into it, but if he hadn't discovered those graves in the pasture and alerted the police, they might have been filled. For the second story, my father-in-law had some farms in Missouri that were bordered by the Missouri River. The Missouri River flows down through the Dakotas, 
along the Iowa-Nebraska border, and then at Kansas City it takes a turn and divides the state of Missouri in two until it reaches the Mississippi. One spring in the late 1990s, he was out in a field next to the Missouri River planting corn. This was before all the current high-tech tools that farmers have at their disposal, now which can tell you if you have an issue with your machine right from the cab. He thought that his planter was having some issues, so he jumped out to check if something was broken. When he got out of his tractor, he noticed a really strange smell. A bad smell. If you know anything about farming, planting season is fast-paced time to try to beat the weather and he was more concerned about getting his crop planted than investigating. He just assumed it was a dead deer washed up in the river and continued on until he though the planter was having problems again a few hours later. This time, he was on the end of the field closer to the river. The smell was stronger and unlike anything he had experienced before. They continued on that day working until one of the hired men asked if anyone noticed the bizarre smell coming from the river. My father-in-law said he had, and wondered to them if it was a dead deer, but usually deer didn't stink quite like this. One of the hired men wandered across the field to the edge of the river. It's not like a nice sandy beach that touches the ground to make a shoreline. Often it is a rocky or steep overlook many feet down to the river below to get a closer look. At the bottom, he saw what he thought was animal tangled in the branches washed up by the river. Looking closer, he realized it was a person. They immediately called the police. Turns out, it was a missing woman who was a known prostitute from Kansas City who had made it this far downstream. I cannot find the exact article or name, and I don't know if the police ever told my father-in-law her name even though they briefly questioned him. But I do know there are a few articles of women being found in the river east of KC in the late 1990s. Thanks for listening, Horror Cowboys. See you tomorrow at the same time.